the zebra murders. What an insane story today. The zebra murders were a series of racially motivated attacks and murders committed in San Francisco, California by some so-called death angels. From October of 1973 to April of 1974, a group of at least four killers truly terrorized the city. They murdered at least 15 people, wounded at least eight others. Residents of San Francisco lived in constant fear for months. Children were excused from school. Businesses closed early. Few dared to walk alone at night. Busy downtown areas turned into ghost towns as soon as the sun set. The randomness of the attacks added so much to the terror. Anyone who fit the general victim profile, which was anyone young or old, man or woman who was white, could be a target. The perpetrators were members of the Nation of Islam, part of an alleged secretive inner circle, kind of a cult within what some already saw as a cult, the Death Angels, who believed that white people were truly evil beings who needed to be killed to restore paradise on earth for black people worldwide. It's possible that the zebra killers, as they were also known, murdered as many as 70 or more victims. The true number of attacks will never be confirmed. They weren't arrested until one of their own felt guilty enough to come forward and testify against them, or felt that the time was right to cut a deal, get immunity, and maybe pick up some reward money. And then four killers were convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy and sentenced to life in prison. Criminology professor Anthony Walsh wrote in a 2005 article that the San Francisco-based Death Angels may have killed more people in the early to mid-70s than all the other serial killers operating during that period combined. So why did this happen in San Francisco? Racial tension across the U.S. were high in the early 70s. Despite the new laws of the civil rights era, few real changes were felt yet, even in progressive cities like San Francisco. Black men and women were still subject to racism, discrimination, police brutality, and hatred. Groups like the Nation of Islam, who had established two mosques in the Bay Area in the 60s and 70s, they sometimes encouraged adherents to take justice into their own hands and seek retaliation for wrongdoings. Their message was not one of peaceful protests and sit-ins. It was a message of violence. Overthrow your oppressors by any means necessary. And some inner circle Nation of Islam members, these death angels, they openly advocated for the indiscriminate murder of white people. Wanton murder, justified by twisted and fabricated theology, dreams of bringing about the dawn of a new age fueled by nonsensical doctrine invented in the early 20th century by blatant con artists who founded this hateful bastardization of Islam. The zebra killers used this doctrine to justify a brutal killing spree. They drove around looking for targets. They attacked old and young men and women. Their only consistent motive was to eliminate white devils. Today, in a topic that feels more like a cult episode at times than a true crime episode, I'll give an overview of the Death Angels, brutal attacks and murders in late 1973 and early 1974, and also explain how San Francisco was ripe for some racially charged murders by examining, examining how decades of racism clashed with some wild and horrible nation of Islam teachings in this true crime our species sure can come up with the most outlandish rationalizations to kill each other edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, suck nasty, nuclear power shill, president of the Brick Bradford fan club, marketing exec for the action hero people set, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise be to Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. Uh, thank you again to everyone who has been showing up at the stand updates recently. Still hoping I had a blast in Texas, hoping I had fun in Seattle, Michigan, and Indianapolis. Next up as this episode releases, New Orleans. I've been waiting on a New Orleans show for years. I'm very excited for this one. I'm excited for all of them, but it might be a little bit more special. Uh, and then it's off to uh, Philly, Cleveland, and Columbus. And that's it for the hour I've been touring on, the, uh, the hour I recorded in Minneapolis last December that'll be released uh, somewhere as a special sometime later this year. Uh, and then April 21st and 22nd, I'll be working out new material in Phoenix at Stand Up Live, again in Bloomington, Indiana, May 4th, 5th, and 6th at the Comedy Attic. And then May 11th, 12th, and 13th in Madison, Wisconsin at Comedy on State. So come see the process. Come hear the, the brand new stuff that might not ever make it to a recording or even to social media. And now for this week's merch announcement. And then we're into the show. Another new Night Witches tee featuring Lucifina. 
A uh, man in her bomber plane in a retro camp badge style design. I love this design. Putting this design on a premium comfort colors garment dyed tee in both vintage black and hemp green. Also released the official Night Witches movie poster last week. So head on over to badmagicmerch.com and check it out. Hail the Night Witch Nazi killers and hail Lucifina. Logan, the art warlock, fucking killing it on merch. And that's it for today. Now let's just get into the zebra murders of the Death Angel killers. Uh, so don't forget, the name Zebra doesn't unfortunately come from something super weird. Uh, like the killers wearing uh, matching uh, zebra print tracksuits or anything. None of the killers rode a zebra while committing murders. Uh, none of them even had a pet zebra. Or sometimes put on black and white makeup and wore a butt plug tail and trotted around their bedroom. Some variation of a pony play fetish. Nah, it's not that exciting. Uh, comes from uh, San Francisco Police Department Police Chief Donald Scott assigning members of the task force form to catch these killers using the Z police radio channel exclusively as in the zebra channel, which led to the name, the zebra murders and the zebra killers. Kind of a bummer, right? Uh, don't worry though. A lot of weird shit does await you. Uh, here's how I'm going to attack today's subject. Since the murders were committed racially, we need to know why that was the motivation and to understand that, we'll examine the racial atmosphere of the city of San Francisco at the time of the killings. I was surprised by what I found for whatever reason and the history that led to that atmosphere. Then we will look at the strange religious ideology that gave the killers a, a type of spiritual mission to kill who they killed. An ideology that encouraged them and was reinforced by the racism they encountered in San Francisco. Uh, we'll also zoom in on the supposed beliefs of the sect within a sect these killers were a part of, the Death Angels. And after all that context is established, to me, maybe the most interesting part of today's episode, uh, we'll meet the killer, uh, the killers, plural, and the man who turned them in, and then jump into a timeline lasting from October 20th, 1973 to the present, covering the range of murders the zebra killers were charged with and their fates following their arrests. So speaking about today's topic, a former mayor of San Francisco, Art Agnos, and a man who was shot by some death angels, told CBS San Francisco in 2014, this was such a racially tinged sensitive issue, a radical sect of black Muslims killing white people. It's something this country is not comfortable discussing or remembering. So it sits on the sidelines because of that factor. In the 1970s, San Francisco was considered a, a liberal mecca by many, you know, and in many ways it was. But surprisingly, overall, not when it came to issues of race. Before World War II, there were only a few thousand black people in all of San Francisco. According to Prentice Earl Sanders and Ben Cohen, the authors of the 2011 book, The Zebra Murders, A Season of Killing, Racial Madness, and Civil Rights, they were so few in number that they were barely even a factor in the city's racial calculations. In the 1900 census, about 1,500 of the roughly 350,000 people living in San Francisco identified as black, and that equates to less than one half of 1%. By 1940, 4,500 of the roughly 60 or 650,000 residents identified as black, and that's just barely over one half of 1%. And the few black people who did live in San Francisco were subject to America's nationwide discriminatory Jim Crow laws. For example, one law stated that black people were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk, like at all. They had to walk out in the fucking street, like literally walk through puddles, uh, you know, in the streets gutter whenever it was raining or had recently rained. And this law was actually still enforced well into the 1960s. Another law was that blacks and whites were not allowed to congregate together out in public, right? Like they couldn't walk through the park holding hands or some shit. Yes, in the 1960s, while San Francisco is becoming America's mecca for the counterculture revolution, San Francisco police officers are still stopping interracial couples or just interracial friends walking around together in public. I've read about shit like this since I was in high school, and it still blows me away that it happened so recently that our culture and scarier, you know, our government, our elected leaders, of course, elected by the culture, were so worried about race just several decades ago. When my parents were in school, so worried about something as meaningless as skin color and what part of the world your distant ancestor just happened to have fucked in that they passed laws like this, right? Officers, listen up. We've had reports from numerous concerned and alarmed citizens who have been witnessing an increasing number of Negroes, uh, but they probably, uh, 
Actually, they probably used a fucking much uh, uh, rougher word than that. Uh, <laughs> we're seen walking next to white folk. Sometimes walking, and it pains me to say this, on the sidewalk. Occasionally holding hands and what appears to be romantic gestures. This blatant, illegal, uh, race mingling. What will, what will happen if it's not stopped? What next? Mixed race children? That's what. And what will happen to society if we devolve into a nation uh, of black and white uh, mutts? And then I like to picture this guy uh, I just made up who sadly did exist in some form, uh, meeting like a time traveler and being shown pictures of various successful people uh, with both black and white blood from today, like uh, Lisa Bonet, Alicia Keys, Vanessa Williams, Bruno Mars, Rashida Jones, Mariah Carey, Lenny Kravitz, right? The list goes on and on. And then he's like, oh, 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 wow. Oh, this is, a, this is actually great. <laughs> I'm not sure who I want to fuck more, Vanessa Williams or Lenny Kravitz. But maybe being, uh, before being shown those pictures, he's shown a picture from the final days of Mac- Michael Jackson's life. And he's like, this is what I'm afraid of. This is the future. <laughs> I knew it. I knew I was right to be worried. Then the guy showed him that picture. I just, JK, that doesn't have anything to do with race mingling. Uh, he actually doesn't have any white blood. That's uh, surgeries, pills, and uh, maybe some adrenochrome. But it's just fucking crazy. It's crazy that they were so worked up. And as cartoonish as I was just being, you know that people were like fucking veins bulging behind the scenes. What is happening? So back to the mid 20th century San Francisco racial landscape now. Racism remained commonplace as thousands of black people moved to the area during and right after World War II. Racist housing practices limited these citizens, uh, limited these citizens. Sorry, I have a cold and it's fucking not helping my mush mouth today. Uh, <laughs> limited these citizens to living in the neighborhoods of Fillmore, Bayview, and Hunter's Point. The rest of the city was mostly off limits. And, uh, and still, almost all the city's hotels were refusing to accept black guests. So what brought these extra black residents over to San Francisco? Well, jobs. That's what uh, brings uh, most people to uh, most places, I think. Uh, that, that and romance. But shipbuilding was a big part of Hunter's Point, uh, the industry. And in 1940, the U.S. Navy purchased over 600 acres in Hunter's Point to build the San Francisco Naval Shipyard. And the Navy now became the biggest employer during the war for the working class neighborhood. And hundreds of black families took jobs here amidst the so-called Great Migration. When some 6 million African-Americans left the rural South and headed to the urban Northeast, Midwest, and West uh, between 1910 and 1970. But then when the war ended, many but not all of these black employees suddenly lost their jobs and were replaced by white men returning home from the war. Many of the black families still stayed in the area. The same shit was happening around the country, so where were they going to go? And now they had no opportunities for jobs that would pay them what they had just previously been making. Decade later, with a new demand for low-income housing thanks to shit like this, Public housing projects are constructed in Hunter's Point. Sanders and Cohen wrote in their book, the projects became both an infection and an emblem, radiating poverty and despair. Crime and poverty tick up, creating more and more tension between black residents and white police officers and between black and white residents in general. Then in October of 1973, around the time that the Death Angels started going on a rampage and racking up a lot of confirmed kills, the Navy shipyards at Hunter's Point closed down leaving many more African-Americans without jobs, right? The main reason many of them had moved to San Francisco. And now there were even more people struggling with poverty, people who were angry and felt abandoned by the government. And some of them wanted to take their anger out on somebody, maybe multiple somebodies. Sanders and Cohen wrote, racism in San Francisco wasn't like down South. There wasn't some scowling cracker on the other end of the whip. In San Francisco, racism came at you with a smile, like they were doing you a favor when they told you that they didn't have any jobs open after you'd seen a half dozen white guys fill out applications or that you couldn't buy a house when they had just sold one to a white who made less money. Meanwhile, the San Francisco Police Department uh, that will be trying to stop the racially motivated murders, they're facing their own internal racial conflicts. Prentice Earl Sanders and Rotia Guilford became the city's first black homicide detectives in 1971. They would eventually work with detectives Gus uh, Corris and uh, John Fatanos, leaders of the Zebra Task Force in 1973. Uh, According to Sanders, the only men who really didn't discriminate against them were these other two homicide detectives. Uh, Gus and John were both of Greek ancestry and grew up extremely poor. Being neither Catholic nor Irish, they were also outsiders in the department. Uh, Carreras, I couldn't find his name pronounced, uh, would even say illustrating how he felt he was viewed by his fellow primarily Irish officers. I'm not white, I'm Greek. So fucking weird. 
and irrational how our tribalist meat sack asses needlessly divide ourselves up into these groups, right? Some leftover evolutionary shit, maybe. Being wary of outsiders and sticking to your tribe, I guess, served our hunter-gatherer ancestors pretty well. The same instincts, not as helpful today. Uh, Got to really work to push our minds past old caveman and cavewoman thought patterns. Come on, help us out, Nimrod. Evolve us faster. Uh, at the time of the zebra murders, Sanders and Guilford had filed a lawsuit against the SFPD, citing racism and unfairness directed at black police officers and applicants. For decades, men of primarily, almost entirely, Irish descent ran politics and the police department in San Francisco. And I didn't know that for whatever reason. I did not associate San Francisco as a really uh, Irish city for a while. When Mayor Joseph uh, Alioto, or Alito, I think I added an O in this one spelling, was, uh, was elected in 1968, Italians started to play a role in politics as well, just not yet in the SFPD. In 1973, only one man in the city who was not Irish, or you know, Irish-American, held the rank of captain or higher on the police force. Charlie Barca, another Italian. Mamma mia, cannola, tortellini, fettuccine, Napoli, a Bugatti, Hermione Granger, that's a spice and meatball. I mean, right? The SFPD was an old boys club, and to raise the ranks for decades prior to Barca, you had to be Irish. The first black man hired by the SFPD was Richard Finnis in 1948. Getting some dick into this suck real quick. Old Dick Finnis. Uh, if we didn't mention at least one dude named Richard, would it even be an episode of Time Suck? Otea Guilford was later the first black police officer uh, to drive a patrol car. The SFPD claimed that insurance for black drivers was too expensive before then. Uh, the SFPD hired a few black men in the early 1960s as a show of equality and progress. Future homicide detective Prentice Earl Sanders was a, one of these hires, joining the force in 1964. At that point, there were still less than two dozen black officers in a city of about 740,000 people. I don't know how many officers the department had in total in the 1960s, but I know that the population in 2019 was a tick over 883,000 and that there was 1,869 full-time officers in 2019. So if the number stayed consistent in proportion to the overall population, that would mean that back in the 1960s, there were around 1,500 officers and less than 24 were black, less than 1.5%. Two things stood out to Sanders immediately in this, uh, you know, sea of almost, all, you know, only white officers. Black people were still referred to as colored in reports and black men's eyes were described so weird to me as maroon i don't fucking understand maroon is a dark purple or like a brown crimson color usually depicted as a as a dark red never seen any black people with red eyes i uh, never seen anyone with red eyes demons are often depicted as having red eyes it sounds like maybe black men were being literally demonized in their uh you know physical description depictions uh sanders said he was specifically instructed to stop the mixed couples on the street that i mentioned earlier it was assumed they were up to no good. What what an odd assumption, right? If some white person is hanging out with a black person, he clearly does not respect his or herself. And if he doesn't respect him, his or herself, uh, then he doesn't respect society. Right? They're not hanging out with respectable friends. So might as well bust them for a misdemeanor before they go commit a felony. And then like cut to a young black man on the sidewalk helping an elderly white woman home with her groceries. Uh, then some additional real crime shows up. Real crime partially created due to the bullshit of fake crime, uh, like not being able to walk on the fucking sidewalk or freely congregate with members of the white race. In the mid-60s, the civil rights movement begins to drift towards violence within some factions. Community leaders like Malcolm X preached an eye-for-an-eye eye mentality regarding racism and violence, and they're starting to gain national influence. In 1965, a series of riots spread across the country, Watts, uh, Cleveland, uh, Chicago, Newark, Detroit, then the violence, rage boiling over after decades of mistreatment locally and centuries of mistreatment nationally comes to San Francisco in 1966. In July of that year, Herman George, a black uh, San Francisco Police Department officer, witnesses a group of young black people robbing a white couple. He breaks up the robbery, and in the process, he shoots a young black man. And in an example of how racially divided the city was, now a crowd of black people surround him, uh, screaming at him that he's an Uncle Tom, a race traitor. Protesters at the scene break store windows and burn some cars. Like Martin Luther King Jr. famously once said, a riot is the language of the unheard. Then on September 27th, 1966, Alvin Johnson, a white officer, he's on patrol when he receives a bulletin about a car theft. He sees a stolen vehicle, pulls over the drivers. Two young black men jump out of the car and flee. 
Johnson pursues 16-year-old Matthew Johnson, right? Johnson versus Johnson. And when the unarmed Johnson refuses to stop running, Officer Johnson fires three shots, one of which hits Johnson in the back of the head, killing him instantly. More bigger riots now follow this shooting. And then Black Officer Herman George from the previous situation is caught having an affair with the same woman as a merchant Marine. This other dude shoots him in the shoulder. Herman now lies to his superiors on the force, says he shot himself on the job. The department charges him for lying. And then the Police Officers Association, the SFPD Union, who were supposed to defend him against this charge, they choose not to. Their lawyer literally refuses to defend a black man in 1966. Not 56, not 46, not 1866, 1966. And this is happening, uh, you know, you know, in, in San Francisco, not where I'm recording, not, not in very conservative Idaho. This is happening in San Francisco less than a year before the city's legendary 1967 Summer of Love, when as many as 100,000 people, mostly young people deemed hippies, converged in San Francisco's hate ashbury neighborhood to celebrate equality and love. Right? That summer, the mamas and the papas wrote the song, San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, The Grateful Dead, Singing in San Fran, LSD is flowing, you can't throw a rock without hitting a joint, right? Or an acoustic guitar, free love, tie-dyed shirts, fucking abound, the smell of patchouli's in the air. And still this shit is happening. Still hardcore racism, even in San Francisco. And if San Francisco overall is still racist, you can imagine how racist the rest of the nation is. Uh, people who currently don't understand why many black people today are still angry, people like my younger self, I feel like most of them just don't understand how incredibly recent this history is, how hardcore it was. Right, not that many years ago at all. Well, George being denied legal representation by his own union, one he'd been, of course, paying fucking dues to for years, this leads to the formation of Officers for Justice, a new union created specifically for minority officers. But Officers for Justice will not be able to help Officer George four months after shooting a young man in a robbery attempt, just a few months after getting shot himself by his lover's other lover. On November 13th, Herman George is murdered, making him the first black officer killed in the line of duty in SFPD history. Three assailants opened fire with a 30 caliber rifle as Officer George and two Officer George and two other officers typed their reports. Officer George was shot six times. Another officer was wounded. Uh, George succumbed to his wounds December 16th, 1967, uh, leaving a wife and four kids. And he was suspected of being killed by members of the Black Panthers because of his involvement in the Fillmore and Hunter's Point riots as far as like, you know, shooting a young black man. He was seen as a race traitor, right? His murder was never officially solved. And now back to the union formed over all of this, the Officers for Justice. In 1973, the SFPD had fewer than 150 minority officers, making up less than 9% of the total police force. And about a third of them now form and or join Officers for Justice. And officers uh, were actually, um, all officers, excuse me, were actually allowed to join right? And it didn't matter what race you were. And one white officer did join, Richard Hong, Hongisto. Hongisto, I have no idea how to say his last name. H-O-N-G-I-S-T-O. Your guess is as good as mine. More dick. Got some black dick and some white dick in this suck. BWC and BBC both showing up. If your kids just laugh at those two references, uh, time to talk to them about pornography. As a result of white Richard joining, he was shunned by the other white officers on the force. Membership in Officers for Justice was low, only about 50 officers. And unfortunately, because Officers for Justice didn't have that many members, they found out they had no real power against the uh, main police officers association, the main union, which had hundreds and hundreds of members and ties to local politicians and more resources, you know, deep pockets, etc. So now Officer Prentice Earl Sanders, Rotea Guilford, and other minority members of the force decide they need to file a lawsuit to end racist policies. There were numerous complaints of racial discrimination and mistreatment filed by officers for justice, but nothing changed. The complaints weren't taken seriously. Sanders and Guilford were the highest ranking black men in the police force. Now Sanders suggests suing the police department at an officers for justice meeting. And everyone came to the general consensus of why the fuck not. And they filed their lawsuit in April of 1973 with the help of the law firm public advocates. And of course there is immediate backlash. The POA, The SFPD's primary union begins lobbying to raise money to fight this lawsuit. They also initiate new measures to make it seem like the lawsuit is counterproductive or pointless, like a new recruitment drive amongst minorities. The first hearings start anyway in May of 1973, continue throughout the year. Uh, New homicide detective Sanders later wrote about the tension this all created within the department. 
said the trial was getting started and Gill gave one of the first depositions about racism inside the department. The deposition was in the federal building on Golden Gate. When Gill and I walked out after his testimony, there were some 200 of our fellow officers, put that in quotes, fellow officers, all white, waiting to give us hell. They called us everything in the book from the N-word on down. Gill was the cool one back then. He was 10 years older, knew how to let that shit roll off his back better than me. So he kept pushing through the crowd, just trying to get us out while I kept getting hotter and hotter. Then I heard one son of a bitch call out, somebody ought to take a contract out on those two, and then parenthetical, racial slur omitted. That was it. I lost it. I stopped in my tracks, looked to where I heard the voice and yelled, why doesn't the asshole who said that come over here and try and make good on that contract himself? Oh, fuck yeah. I like Sanders. I like his fire. He continued, I was ready to take on that cracker right there. But before anyone could say another word, Gil grabbed my arm, pulled me away, whispering, come on, man, come on, let's go. All of this, of course, is very public. All of this just further enrages many black members of the community, not just, you know, other officers. Uh, White officers openly calling fellow black officers various racial slurs. One can easily imagine how those same white officers were treating members of the black community who were not on the force. Now, Sanders and Guilford are real ostracized. In the fall of 1973, Guilford and Sanders are in their squad car when they hear on the radio that a robbery has just occurred. They then see a man running down the street who fit the description, chase him down, attempt to subdue him. But the dude is uh, high as fuck on something, meth, PCP. He's fighting them with that kind of PCP strength and tenacity, right, that you don't have normally. So Gil requests some, quote, buddies for backup. And then a voice comes back on the radio and says, you two ain't got no buddies out here. That's how contentious this shit was. Right? Other officers, not going to fucking help them when they call. November 26, 1973, Judge Robert F. Peckham now delivers a preliminary ruling in the lawsuit and he finds the SFPD guilty of discriminatory practices. And he orders the Civil Service Commission and the SFPD to alleviate with due speed the past effects of discrimination and prevent any future discrimination. Peckham also orders that entry-level patrolmen be hired at a three to two minority to non-minority ratio until the minorities in the department reach at least 30%, Judge Peckham also will personally approve all promotions within the department going forward. All of this is coinciding with the first known zebra murders, a.k.a. the Death Angel murders, in San Francisco in late 1973. As Sanders, right, and Guilford began assisting on the uh, zebra task force. They're dealing with conflict that closely is mirroring what is going on in the city at this time. The zebra murders were committed as a direct reaction to the long-standing racism of the area fueled by the Nation of Islam's crazy-ass teachings that white people were devils. Let's talk about the the NOI now. Oh, boy. I had too much fun diving back into all of this. Uh, It has been a while since I last peaked the Nation of Islam. I haven't dived into them since the Nation of Yahweh cult suck, suck, excuse me, episode 182 back in March of 2020. That's (laughs) that's ridiculous suck, where we learned that the, uh, the cult leader... Yahweh ben Yahweh, uh, at one point uh, actually tricked uh, female followers into thinking that if if, uh, if a woman is having like, you know, trouble with her, her pregnancy, like late stage pregnancy, it's like pain uh, that the baby inside uh, might be, um, you know, not able to breathe and to perform CPR on an unborn baby, you got to blow into the mom's vagina. <laughs> it's just, uh, both ridiculous and, you know, actually dangerous. And that was just his way of, I guess, you know, trying to sneak in a little pervy uh, tricking women into going down on other women. But anyway, that's the last time we really dove into the NOI. The story of the zebra murders is very, very closely connected to the Nation of Islam. Decades of local racism, right, fueled a lot of anger in the black community of San Francisco towards white people, and the teachings of the NOI gave some black residents spiritual permission to do something about it. The killings were said to be motivated by an interpretation of the NOI teaching that white people are devils and deserving of violence. For some, for the death angels, they were led to believe the white people were an evil scourge upon the earth and that Allah was ready to fucking wipe them off the planet. Not only was murdering white people not seen as a bad thing, it was seen as noble, part of God's plan to restore earth to a paradise, a paradise that will finally be rid of inherently evil white devils. The killings pre-involved members of the Nation of Islam based in a San Francisco mosque. Um, often referred to as the San Francisco mosque, uh, may have been an Oakland mosque, actually. Nation of Islam mosque number 26 was set up in San Francisco in the 1960s. Uh, Cannot find an exact date in any of the sources. It's barely mentioned in sources on the web. Uh, And then Mosque 26B was founded in Oakland in 1968. Uh, The only NOI mosque in the Bay Area now is the one in Oakland uh, that is now just number 26, not number 26B. Pretty confusing. Some sources refer to Oakland. Most say San Francisco. 
all seem to refer to mosque number 26. So I'm going to say these were members of the original mosque 26 in San Francisco proper. And and law enforcement alleged that they were also connected to the death angels. As I've said, right, the secretive NOI militant group thought to be responsible for who knows how many murders nationwide. A very footnoted source I found on a collegiate database, academia.edu, seems certain that the death angels were responsible for over 300 killings in just California, with 165 of them taking place in the early 1970s. I first talked about the death angels in that nation of Yahweh cult suck. Robert Rozier, a member of that cult, previously identified as an NOI death angel and actually identified as one while he was in the nation of Yahweh cult suck. Uh, Rozier was a defensive end in the NFL for uh, just a couple games for the Raiders and the Rams in the late 70s. In the early 80s, he joined the nation of Yahweh and killed at least four white people, more likely killed seven, based on insane religious teachings and then testified against a group in exchange for a greatly reduced sentence. In 1986, this dude literally went hunting for white devils on behalf of a group of death angels within the nation of Yahweh cult. Uh, He cut one white dude's ear off after killing him and brought it back to his cult leader as proof of what he had done. And I'll talk more about the death angels, quite a bit more about their beliefs. uh, After an overview on the insane founding of the NOI, and we've covered some of this already in the, uh, again, the nation of Yahweh cult suck, but you know, definitely worth covering again since it's been a few years. Islam was first brought to the U.S. by enslaved Africans back in the pre-Civil War era but it would not actually gain a real foothold as a proper religion in the U.S. until the 20th century. While a few sources I found allude to the first mosques in the U.S. open in the late 1800s, these sources do not mention the exact year or city or even state that these supposed mosques existed in. So maybe that happened. Uh, The first mosque uh, that we seem to know like a date and location for did not open where I expected it to uh, at all. Like if I was asked to guess which state, Uh, I don't think this state would have shown up in my first 40 guesses. Maybe not in my first 45. Have you made your own guess yet? North Dakota. If you got that right, you're either really lucky or, you know, have heard this story before or should probably try and get on Jeopardy if you haven't already. Uh, And if I was told it was in North Dakota and asked to name the town, I would have had uh, to have gotten a map out after exhausting the first five or six towns in North Dakota. I can actually name off the top of my head. And then looking at the map, only sheer luck would have helped me guess this. Want to make a guess? Ross. Ross, North Dakota. Population 88. In 1929, some immigrants from what is now Syria and Lebanon erected a mosque on the periphery of Ross, about 60 miles from uh, from the Canadian border. The tiny Muslim community uh, who sought farmland through the Homestead Acts held services in a very small sub-basement building, a little 364-square-foot shelter that offered a coal stove, benches, and prayer rugs barely a mosque and that original structure no longer exists the longest surviving mosque uh, currently is in cedar rapids iowa now referred to as the mother mosque of america it was finished in 1934 could not find square footage info for it but it's been out of use since 1971 and prior to that was only big enough for about 50 muslims to worship in at one time clearly islam remained virtually non-existent in the u.s until the beginning of the 20th century and then it began to grow mostly thanks to the efforts of the Ahmadiyya, Ahmadiyya movement, uh, a sect founded in India by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. A follower of this movement was a man named uh, Shak Ahmad Faisal, who went on to become a leader of the so-called independent black Muslim movement. In 1924, Faisal met a woman who was Muslim and a recent immigrant to New York in Granada, where he uh, was born and raised. They married that year, moved to New York, and he became connected with the Academy of Islam a group of black Muslims who gathered to study and pray in Harlem in the early 1930s. In 1934, Faisal established a small Muslim village named uh, Medina al-Salam near Fishkill, New York, that would last until 1942. Uh, He also established the Islamic Mission of America in 1939, which became New York City's largest mosque for over two decades. And one of Faisal's contemporaries was Noble Drew Ali, aka Timothy Drew was his birth name. And this dude... Uh, wow. Uh, Noble Ali founded, uh, or Noble Drew, founded the Moorish Science Temple of America in New York, New Jersey in 1913, which tied Muslim teachings with black nationalism. He produced the Holy Quran, a new text that is not actually all that similar to the original Quran. So it can be argued he didn't really practice Islam. I would say he did not. He mutated it into something else, something very different. He was more of a, a cult leader 
who made crazy ass claims and really bastardized the teachings of Islam. And also, yes, 1913 is a lot earlier than 1929 when the North Dakota mosque was uh, erected, but Noble Ali never really founded a true mosque. So this guy, his early life is shrouded in mystery, like most nefarious cult leaders' lives are. And it's said that he traveled to Egypt as a young man where he met a high priest of Egyptian magic. As one does, if you travel to Egypt and you don't take some time to meet up with a high priest of Egyptian magic, well, you fucking wasted your trip. And in one version of Drew Ali's biography, this magic priest, whatever the hell that is, this guy let him know that he was a reincarnation. Here we go. Of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. Oh, fuck yeah, bro. What, what great news. What a great day. Uh, in other biographies, Drew claims this Egyptian magic priest considered him a reincarnation of Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, and still other religious prophets. Of course he was. He was the best of the best of the best. Hey, uh, you know all of the major prophets of the past who established all the major religions of today? You're those guys. You're all of them. Assembled into one. Dare I say it, you are the Voltron of prophets. Ready to form Voltron. Activate interlock. Dinotherms connected. Infracells up. Mega thrusters are go. All for Voltron. Hell yes. Uh, according to one biography, the high priest trained Ali in mysticism and gave him a lost section of the Quran. He was just waiting around, this fucking magic priest guy, he was waiting around in Egypt for this guy to show up so he could hand him, uh, you know, all of the parts of the Quran that God forgot uh, to give Muhammad. So he, uh, he, t- he took a page from Joseph Smith's playbook and showed up with some new shit, right? That God just uh, it, it skipped his mind to mention it earlier. Yeah, totally. This guy seems super credible and legit. So Noble Drew, uh, well, he writes some new shit, changes some existing shit, borrows, a.k.a. plagiarizes from other religious texts to make his uh, Quran 2.0. And Drew taught that all black people were of Moorish origins. They were black Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula uh, or Northwestern Africa. And that is categorically not true. Like 1000% for sure a bunch of bullshit. In the first 150 years of the slave trade, West Central Africa, excuse me, supplied nine out of 10 African people destined for a life of slavery in the Americas. And while about uh, a third of West Africans at that time were Muslim, about two thirds were not. But you know, whatever. Who cares about historical accuracy when you're a con artist uh, making up some new religious mumbo jumbo to take people's money with? So Noble Drew taught adherents, you know, who of course paid him tithes, uh, that their ancestors were for sure Moors, 100% but that this uh, Islamic identity was taken away from them through slavery and segregation forced upon them by white devils. And now it was time that they should return to Islam and reclaim their original spiritual heritage. He taught his people to identify as more instead of as black. His temple was very strict, did follow, you know, all the rules Muslims normally follow, but, you know, added a bunch of stuff with his uh, Holy Quran, uh, which is what they read from. Noble Drew would eventually relocate to the Midwest, uh, living in Chicago primarily. Uh, He would amass thousands of followers and have 17 temples built called Moorish Science Temples. And then he would die in 1929 at the age of 43. And his Moorish temples would be split into different factions, one of which was the Nation of Islam. Uh, The Nation of Islam was founded in 1930 in Detroit, Michigan. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, since its founding in 1930, the Nation of Islam has grown into one of the wealthiest and best known organizations in black America. It's theology of innate black superiority over whites and the deeply racist, anti-Semitic and anti-LGBT rhetoric of its leaders have earned the NOI a prominent position in the ranks of organized hate. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, This is this is not overall a good organization. Uh, The NOI does offer numerous programs designed to uplift the black community, but many of their beliefs, their core beliefs are, are problematic to say the least. They are not team meat sack. No, they are, they are team fuck white devils. Uh, again, according to the SPLC, uh, the NOI was founded by a mysterious clothing salesman in Detroit in 1930. His founder was a man named Wallace D. Fard, maybe. Dude had a lot of aliases. Uh, Farad Muhammad, Wallace Dodd, Wallace Ford, Wally D. Ford, uh, Wally Ford, uh, Wallace and Farad. Fard was born in New Zealand on February 26, 1891 to a British father and a Polynesian mother, maybe, or maybe born in Saudi Arabia. 
1877, or maybe born in Oregon or Hawaii. And he might not have literally any African blood in him. Uh, the California Bureau of Identification and Investigation names Fard as Wallace Ford. Michigan State Police and the LAPD have him under the name Wallace Farad and Wally D. Ford. And the FBI determined that uh, these are all the same person. And in all cases, he is listed as Caucasian. Interesting. More on that later. Well, Fard was once a member of the Moorish Science Temple in Newark, New Jersey, right? Noble Ali's original teaching center. When he founded the NOI in the year after Drew's death, he claimed that he was the reincarnation of noble Drew Ali. On a reincarnation talk. You know, totally. And curious take on reincarnation. That you can be yourself until around the age of somewhere between 38 and 52. And then a, a guy you know dies. And now you are also him. <laughs> so Nation of Islam, uh, what a cool origin story. Right? Back to back, just blatant wackadoodle con artists. Well, Fard Muhammad, acting as a door-to-door traveling salesman, he spreads his new religious teachings throughout Detroit and within three years grows the movement to a reported eight to 9,000 members in Detroit, Chicago, and other cities before he just poof, disappears from the historical record in 1934. Dude just fucking vanished. Declassified FBI files show the FBI tried for decades to figure out what happened to him. And apparently they have no idea. At least that's what they're telling us. Uh, Master Fard Muhammad taught NOI members that over 6,000 years ago, black people lived in a paradise on earth. All right. Okay. So far, so good. Sounds nice. He preached that things were fucking awesome. Like the most awesome. Like wish you could have seen it and stuff. Best part about paradise. Everyone is black. Literally everyone. No white devils. Our inherently evil asses did not exist yet. And that is why it was paradise. We hadn't ruined shit yet. And then we did ruin everything. An evil scientist named Yakub, a man the NOI claims to be the biblical Jacob. Well, he destroyed this paradise by creating, quote, white devils through a process called, <laughs> quote, grafting some kind of magical form of selective breeding. Um, basically, you know how lots of breeding turned uh, some wolves into Pomeranians eventually? That's us. That's white folk. <laughs> we were once powerful wolves, aka black folk. But then we got way watered down and wussified, and magicified, and, uh, you know, now we are two-legged Pomeranians. So why the fuck would Yakub do this? Well, it's an interesting story. And interesting doesn't feel like a lot of thought was put into it. Uh, how the fuck does anyone actually believe this? Even less credible than most religious accounts of how we humans got here, which I'm almost never a fan of, and consistently stunned that any rational people believe these stories, kind of story. Growing up, Yakub acquired the nickname Big Head. Yep, he starts getting called Big Head because he had a big head <laughs> and was also arrogant. This is the story. Big Head is said to have been born in Mecca over 6,000 years ago at a time when roughly 30% of original black people were just generally uh, dissatisfied for some reason. Is there any archaeological evidence that humans even lived in Mecca 6,000 years ago? No, no, this is, we don't, we don't have any of this stuff in writing anywhere. Of course there isn't, but who cares because magic? By the age of six, well, Big Head discovered the law of attraction and repulsion by playing with magnets made out of steel. And somehow that inspired him to engage in selective breeding. <laughs> Seems like quite a jump, but okay. Uh, he, quote, saw an unlike human being made to attract others who could, with the knowledge of tricks and lies, rule the original black man. And again, why would this black man want to create a new kind of being whose goal was to rule black, black people? Well, because he was evil and evil people do evil things. Uh, that really is the explanation. <laughs> Maybe he was really mad about being given the nickname Big Head or something. Uh, like I said, the story it wasn't thought out very well. And by the age of 18, Big Head exhausted all knowledge in the universities of Mecca, even though there weren't any universities back then, and discovered that the original black man contained both a black germ and a brown germ. And then with exactly 59,999 followers, very specific number, he travels to the Greek Isle of Patmos and the Aegean Sea, and he fucking takes it over. He takes over this island, all right? 60,000 people strong. They start running the show. Any historical record of this? No, of course not. We don't even know if people lived on that island, uh, you know, back then. But once he took shit over, Big Head and his exactly 59,999 followers, they set about breeding out the black traits of black people, killing the darkest babies and creating a brown race in about mm, 200 years. Just to be dicks, I guess. A lot of people jumped in on this guy's evil plan to make a bunch of people to rule over them and destroy their paradise. And then Yakub died at the nice round age of 150. So he died a little bit before the brown babies were made. 
And there were a bunch of tears and stuff. And then his evil followers continued with his evil work for centuries. After exactly 600 years of deliberate eugenics, the white race is created. And the brutal conditions of their creation determined their evil nature. Quote, by lying to the black mother of the baby, this lie was born into the very nature of the white baby. And murder for the black people was also born in them or made by nature a liar and murderer. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that's exactly how nature works. Everyone knows if you lie to a pregnant mom, that lie gets stuck in her baby. And that becomes part of the baby's nature. That's why OBGYNs often grab new mothers at their first checkups and just scream into their faces. Do not lie. Do, do, don't fucking do anything bad or you'll have an evil baby who can never be made good again. And if your OBGYN didn't do that, well, newsflash, you got the shit end of the medical stick. And now your baby is all kinds of fucked up. You got an evil little front butt dump. So congrats. Actually, what am I saying? If you're even a little bit white, you're already fucked up. And there's no chance of saving your stupid white baby from being fucked up too. And that makes sense. My kids? Ha! <laughs> Kyler Monroe? Oh, evil as shit. Uh, now this new evil white race travels back to Mecca where they cause a lot of trouble because that's what evil people do. Uh, so much trouble, they're exiled to Europe and quote, stripped of everything but language. <laughs> Once there, they are roped in to keep them out of paradise. The soldiers patrol the border armed with swords to prevent the devils from crossing. Yeah! You gotta guard that white devil perimeter. Keep us contained. Don't kill us and solve the problem forever. No, that's that's too easy. Now just keep us locked in a large area with abundant natural resources and game and let us breed a whole bunch. Right? Mm-hmm. That makes a uh, makes a lot of sense. For many centuries, us white devils lived in a lived a barbaric life in Europe, surviving naked in caves, eating raw meat. <laughs> but eventually, we were drawn out of the caves by the biblical Moses who took pity on us, I guess, and taught us how to wear clothes. I don't remember that part of the Old Testament, the part where Moses teaches us white folk to wear clothes, but that happened. And Far taught that Moses tried to civilize us white devils, but fucking gave up. He was like, fuck these idiots. And he got so mad at a few of us. He literally blew up 300 of the most troublesome crackers with dynamite. (laughs) Even though there wasn't dynamite back then, he did it anyways because magic. And I definitely don't remember that part of the Old Testament where Moses has just fucking had it with some particularly meddlesome uh, white folk and blows them up with dynamite, right? Just like uh, some some new, for, some forgotten chapter, just book of Exodus, chapter 41, uh, the bonus chapter that you don't have in your Bible. Don't even worry about it. Just verses uh, one through three. So it came about that Moses could not deal anymore with the most evil of the evil white devils. And he entreated the Lord to help him rid of his people. Sorry. <laughs> he entreated the Lord to help him rid his people of these honky monsters. Oh, Lord, please hear my cries. I just simply cannot deal with these blasphemous crackers any longer. Can I please blow them to smithereens? And the Lord thus provided Moses with many sticks of glorious dynamite. And the Lord saith, get those motherfuckers. Blow these white devil crackers to hell. And Moses did as the Lord God commanded. And the white devils were blown to hell and God smiled. And then black Jesus popped down through the clouds just for a second and gave Moses a little fucking thumbs up. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, Just a little nod to show his approval. Amen. Well, unfortunately, Moses didn't blow up all of us. If you didn't know, we white people are like cockroaches. We're hard to kill and we breed a lot. And eventually us whites learn to use something called trichnology. (laughs) This is part of the teachings. Yeah, trichnology. What a great word. And what is trichnology? Well, I'm glad you asked. Trichnology was the white devil's plan to use a lack of empathy, emotion, and trickery to usurp power and enslave the black population, bringing the first slaves to America. And according to the autobiography of Malcolm X, all the races other than the black race were byproducts of Yakub's work as the quote, red, yellow, and brown races were created during the bleaching process to create the whites. However, the black race did include some Asian people considered to be shared ancestors of the Moors. And they're like, okay, they're not evil devils. True whites were eventually defined as Europeans. And Fard Muhammad's successor, former right-hand man, Elijah Muhammad, well, he goes on now to assert that some of the new white race uh, tried to graft themselves back into the black nation, but they had nothing to go by, like no instructions. Like, we're we're too stupid. We're dumb. And as a result, these new products (laughs) of grafting became gorillas. 
Some of them. Others became monkeys. I find all this so fucking entertaining. (laughs) It feels like the kind of silly bullshit I make up almost every week. But this was serious. And is serious. Still to thousands and thousands of people. Uh, The Nation of Islam now taught that all members of the monkey kingdom are the result of fucked up attempts by ancient white people to become black again. So like they're part white, part uh, just monkey. And uh, and in closing, according to the NOI doctrine, uh, Yakub's creation were destined to rule for 6,000 years before the original black peoples of the world regained dominance, a process that these early NOI, uh, you know, uh, teachers t- uh, taught began in 1914, right? So the time is now, like if things have gotten started, let's fucking go. Time to be rid of these white fucking devil monkey motherfuckers once and for all. And when Fard and then Elijah Muhammad are peddling this shit, you know, it's, it's all very cult-like. Uh, very second coming is about to go down. Stick with me if you want to be in the right place with the right beliefs for this dawn of a new age, right? The white devils are about to be overthrown. The 6,000 years of terror are over. Praise be to Allah. Uh, early NOI leaders and theologians, far to Muhammad, preached uh, of this coming apocalypse that would overthrow the white domination of the world. Uh, the white's dominion of evil would end with God appearing on earth in the person of Fard, they taught. And after God's appearance, an epic struggle would ensue. And the nation of Islam, of course, would play a key VIP front row uh, role in educating and preparing the original people to retake their place slash power on earth. Moving away from theology now and reconnecting with NOI history, as I touched on, Fard established the first NOI mosque in Detroit, Michigan. His assistant, Elijah Muhammad, then founds uh, a second temple in Chicago, and Elijah Muhammad becomes the main leader of the NOI in 1934 when Fard just fucking disappears. And Muhammad teaches that Fard was a prophet and savior. God reincarnated. He got whisked up to heaven and he's going to come back, you know, uh, when the fucking the war really gets going. In 1945, Elijah Muhammad begins building the NOI's wealth by purchasing farmland in Michigan and founding businesses and educational ventures in other states. And these investments will later, you know, become worth millions and millions. And how did he get that money? Well, from his followers, of course, right? Always the same story. A big increase in NOI membership occurred in the 1950s with the rise of the civil rights movement. NOI's white devil rhetoric suddenly became more and more appealing to more black Americans tired of the bullshit they've been dealing with their whole fucking lives, uh, the bullshit numerous generations of their ancestors had been dealing with, right? They had been victimized by actual white devil types, hateful races. New prominent members like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali increased the group's visibility and membership. Malcolm X is appointed to a leadership position at Harlem's Temple No. 7 in 1954, two years after he was released from prison, He was very popular, served as a prominent member of the NOI. Membership skyrockets under him. However, Malcolm X was alienated from many other civil rights leaders because of the NOI's hateful language and advocacy of self-defense instead of nonviolence. By 1959, MLK was warning a hate group arising in our midst that would preach the doctrine of black supremacy or warning of. And he was, of course, talking about the NOI. The mid-60s now see a second surge in membership. NOI had a new and more militant generation of leaders focused on racial problems in northern states. The NOI preached that black elevation could come only through a radical separation from the structures of white oppression. Uh, the message resonated with many in San Francisco. All right, in 1964, Malcolm X splits off from Elijah Muhammad, and then rising NOI leader Louis Farrakhan is appointed to Temple Number no. 7 to lead it. Farrakhan joined the NOI in 1955. He was working as a cabaret singer until he met Malcolm X. Farrakhan was a talented speaker and organizer and quickly won over the congregation at the temple. He rose further in 1965 when Malcolm X is assassinated. He was a smooth talker, charismatic, became the national spokesman of the NOI in 1967. Elijah Muhammad will die in 1975. Farrakhan takes over, tries to show his dedication to Muhammad's son, Wallace Dean, later uh, uh, Warith Dean Muhammad or Imam uh, Waritha Dean Muhammad, who succeeded Elijah Muhammad. But Wallace D. tried to dismantle the NOI's material empire and integrate with mainstream Islam. So in 1977, Farrakhan rejects Wallace D., declares the founding of a resurrected NOI based on Elijah Muhammad's original ideology. And reconnecting now with what I had touched on earlier, Wallace D. uh, claims that Fard was not the reincarnation of God on earth. Couldn't be because he was a white man. And how about them apples, right? There's a lot of speculation that the founder of this black supremacist organization, the Nation of Islam, was not a black man himself. (laughs) According to the FBI, Fard was not at all black, not from Mecca. He was either a dark-complexioned white man or perhaps a mixed white and Asian man originally from either Oregon, Hawaii, or New Zealand. 
who prior to becoming a prophet lived in Los Angeles during the 1910s where he was a uh, derelict husband, uh, not a good dad, left his kids, small time opium dealer who was locked up in San Quentin from 1926 to 1929. The strongest evidence for this, photographs and fingerprints of Wallace Dodd Ford purportedly from San Quentin uh, matched those of Fard who was arrested in Detroit in the 1930s. So, you know, what a mess. Okay. So now that we've covered some key and fucking absurd uh, beliefs regarding the nation of Islam at the time of the zebra killings, before meeting the actual killers, let's take a, a second to talk about the, the secretive group within a group that the killers belong to, right? The death angels. Even during the early years of the nation of Islam, there were rumors of an elite group of black assassins in Detroit whose job it was to systematically kill and mutilate the white grafted devil, uh, also uh, called a grafted snake, in order to purge the greater black nation of its detrimental effects and to keep the blood of the, using NOI words here, original black man, God of the universe, pure, blood only to be intermingled with the blood of the black woman, a.k.a. mother of civilization. Allegedly meetings for this elite group, known by NOI leadership as Calistran, the group also known as the Death Angels, were held separate from local Nation of Islam temples. Members of the Death Angels saw themselves as an elite guard that wished to help usher the rise of a new world order, a black world order. The leaders of the Calistran were, uh, and I say were because I, I, I can't find any info that credibly makes a claim for this group to still exist today, maybe, but I don't know, uh, always a shadowy group who taught new potential recruits that killing a certain number of white grafted devils, white snakes, would allow them into an elite group in the nation commonly called the Death Angels. And these Death Angels uh, were later called, uh, you know, following the zebra killings, uh, deranged and dangerous by spokesmen for the official nation of Islam. But did the NOI secretly endorse them? Well, allegedly, definitely yes. Uh, am I surprised? No, based on the history of the nation of Islam, you know, definitely not. Uh, a faction of this group is strongly believed to have existed within the San Francisco Mosque, NOI Mosque number 26, where the zebra killers were based. And to become a member of the Death Angels, a.k.a. the Calistran in San Francisco, one supposedly had to kill four white children uh, or five white women or nine white men. That was like, to, you know, or I don't know how they determined the exact criteria if like if it was like two white women plus like a, a one white man and, a, and one white kid, you could mix it up. But yeah, white men were valued the least, white women valued more, white kids valued the most. And when the quota was reached, the new member now had his picture taken with a Polaroid camera and black wings drawn extending from his neck uh, on the photo. And the picture was then placed on a board along with portraits of other angels. And that board would be displayed during group meetings. And sometimes a photograph of, uh, of the murder would be requi uh, required as proof that you did one of these killings. According to informant Anthony Harris, in October of 1973, there were at least 15 death angels in California. Um, and he saw their picture displayed on a, on a board in San Francisco. According to the best source I can find, by October of 1973, uh, the, the Death Angels were responsible for killing 135 white men, 75 white women, and 60 white kids throughout the state. A typical early 1970s meetings of the Death Angels from Mosque Number 26 is portrayed by author Clark Howard. Howard published a book in 1979 called Zebra, The True Account of the 179 Days of Terror in San Francisco. And he spent nearly five years researching and writing this, and he wrote... The meetings were held in the loft of a San Francisco warehouse. They were conducted by a dignified black man with a Van Dyke beard. He wore a business suit and spoke in a quiet, almost, uh, you know, ministerial tone. The population of the white man in North America has reached 103 million. He said the population of the black man is only 17 million. The population of the white man throughout the world is only 400 million, while the population of the black man throughout the world has now reached four and a half billion. I don't, I don't think those numbers were right, but that's what he said. Uh, the speaker goes on to talk about how much American land is controlled by the white and black races, how the white race came into existence, how it came to rule over the black man, all the Yacoub stuff, right? After explaining the creation of the white race by the evil black scientist Yacoub, old fucking big head McGee, he goes on to tell of how only the righteous can overcome the teachings of the teachers of spookology, tricknology, and the mystery got more weird NOI concepts there in addition to tricknology that it would take too much time away from the main narrative to explain uh, in order to bring the world, the true light of Islam. And the speaker said the 400 years of white subjugation of the black man in America is due to end in order to prove this. He reads from the message to the black man, some NOI literature written by Elijah Muhammad, selecting quotes to talk about killing grafted white devils. And the meeting ends with him telling the audience about the black angels. 
following these meetings, some members go take the teachings uh, and find some white grafted devils to kill in order to assist the rise of the black nation. SFPD also got a firsthand account of what it meant to be a death angel. On February 17, 1974, a strange letter arrived on the desk of the San Francisco detectives in charge of investigating the so-called zebra killings. It was supposedly written from a fringe member of Calistran. The letter appeared in Clark Howard's book on the zebra killings. And I'll add, every time the writer of this letter says Muslim, he is talking about NOI Muslims, which is not the same as Muslim. Right? Yakub, all the uh, race war horse shit does not appear in the actual Quran. So if this letter says, I was once a Muslim and I know that the Muslims do advocate the killing of whites. In fact, they preach the extermination of the entire white race. Uh, and then here he asked for his name not to be released for fear of his life. And it says, perhaps an understanding of some of the basis for the white race hatred would make it easier to understand how a Muslim can kill without the slightest feeling of guilt. It is believed and taught that every black person is born with a black and brown gene. At one time, long ago, a Muslim scientist, old big head, uh, kept extracting the brown gene until he came up with a yellow person and finally a white person who was the epitome of everything bad. The purpose of this, so says the myth, is for the perfection of the black man. Huh. Uh, through looking at the evil of the white devil and struggling with him, could he in turn perfect himself? Oh, so that's why he cooped did it. Oh, okay, all right. The Muslim ministers uh, teach that the hereafter is not going to be heaven, but rather the earth after the white devil has been overcome. It is very easy to hate enough to kill if you are a Muslim. When you go to the temple, you are told how the white devil raped your grandmother and how she was made to pull the plow with her body while the white devil's animals rested. You are worked into a religious fervor, a fervor of hate. You feel that it is your sacred duty to avenge the injustices that were done to your ancestors. The ministers tell you that you should kill white babies, that no white man should survive on earth, and that the black race must overcome the devil. Many times I became so angry that I wanted to run out and hack up a white person. I would have felt justified in doing it. The Muslims take no responsibility for the reactions to their teachings. The killings of whites is no new thing. Every month I was there, someone had gone out and killed someone. Check the police records for the motiveless, brutal killings of whites in the streets the past few years, and you will see that this is true. The Muslims have built in protection whereby if you get into trouble with the police, you are no longer a Muslim. It is not that no Muslim ever does anything wrong, but rather that he is disowned by the group if he ever gets caught. The Muslims indoctrinate their members in three ways. The first is the teachings of race hatred and of the superiority of the black race. The second is through symbology. Symbols of the cross, the flag, and then the sword are placed on pictures or blackboards in the temples, and you are constantly reminded that the white religion, the white nation, and the white race should come to a violent end. The third means is through the military, like drilling of the fruit of Islam. Uh, that's a, like the men's security group within the uh, nation of Islam. Here you are taught to march, to respond to commands without thinking, to react without judgment. A command need only be whispered and you are so well trained that you react before you even realize you have reacted. I've heard a Muslim minister speak of killing of whites in San Francisco. So, you know, fucking hardcore shit. Uh, the official reason given by Kalisran for the killing sprees in San Francisco in the uh, early 70s was to scare whites into moving in order to make San Francisco a black Muslim stronghold. These killings were committed as per police records of the San Francisco murders by nine members of Calistran, but only four were able to be charged. Okay, let's meet those four convicted zebra killers now and the man who would act as a police informant against him, Anthony Harris. Before we're heading into a timeline of the six months of terror they created in San Francisco in 1973 and 1974. Uh, I find all this very interesting. I hope you do as well. This is one of the more interesting episodes we've done in a while for me. Well, I guess we've done, I, I said that a lot. So I get swept up into whatever I'm researching. Now I'm remembering, like, no, I felt the same about a lot of these recent ones. Anyway, informant Anthony Cornelius Harris was 29 years old at the time of the zebra murders trial, described as a slender, well-groomed, good-looking black man, about five feet, 11 inches tall. He grew up in Santa Ana and Long Beach with five brothers and two sisters, dropped out of school before his sophomore year of high school. Shortly before that, at the age of 14, he began practicing Kung Fu. By his late teens, Harris was married to a white woman who he had two children with in Southern California. Some of his brothers also married white women, <laughs> but he would still go on to join the Nation of Islam and attend Calistran meetings. Fucking wild. Listening and agreeing with a bunch of white devil rhetoric. Yeah, yeah, no, I gotta fucking kill my kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The strange echo chamber some of us end up in. Uh, in 1966, Harris was convicted of second degree burglary. Then in July of 1971, he was convicted of... Uh, uh, second degree burglary, burglary again, sentenced to state prison where he will meet up with some NOI idiots. 
In early of 73, Harris meets Jesse Lee Cooks and Manuel Moore in San Quentin, where they're all serving time. According to the defendant's 1983 appeal, Cooks was about 29 years old, black, muscular, about six feet tall, and a boxer or fighter. Moore was also about 29 years old, black, six feet one, uh, muscular, weighed 200 to 210 pounds. Uh, right? These are these are guys who could have gotten out and then had fucking great lives, right? They fucking sound like they're good looking, fit dudes. Um, Jesse Lee Cooks, a felon with uh, 1965 and 1966 convictions for bank robbery. Manuel Moore in prison for violating his parole for a 1969 burglary conviction. Moore grew up in San Bernardino with six brothers and seven sisters. Holy shit, big family. Uh, he also had white stepbrothers and stepsisters, uh, his white stepmother's children. Moore claimed that he attended school through the ninth grade, never did learn to read or write, and then martial arts you know, connected him to Anthony Harris. Harris was teaching other inmates kung fu, and Cooks and Moore asked him to teach them. Cooks said straight up, apparently, that he wanted to learn kung fu because he wanted to kill white people, just in general. During his defense, he gave his reasoning as, they had castrated and killed and stomped our babies' heads in, he specifically wanted to learn how to, quote, break people's necks, punch their eyes out, break their heads, and bust their hearts. <laughs> Yikes. God damn. Uh, as a student of history, of course I can see how a black man would hate what white slave owners did to their ancestors. I can see how he would hate the racism he recently encountered via Jim Crow laws, how he uh, would still encounter racism that would enrage him. But just to want to kill all white people, just carte blanche, it's just so sad. How sad whenever we do that in any form as a species, right? When we go to a place of just fuck all, you know, whites or fuck all blacks, liberals, conservatives, etc. Unless you're referring to a group formed specifically out of hate, like fuck all of the, you know, Ku Klux Klan, or specifically based in some blatantly immoral predilection, like, you know, fuck all pedophiles. The group is going to have good members and bad members. I, I wish I could push a magic button to make everyone in the world understand that. Some white people are cunts. Some are wonderful. Some black people are cunts. Some are wonderful. And so on and so forth for every single race. Right? Labeling all of a group like that, either good or bad, it's just, ah, it's so ignorant. It just, and it still happens in mass, you know, across the world today. Uh, well, Cook said that he, uh, when he got out of prison, he was going to join the Death Angels. He was familiar with them and he wanted to help them start a race war. According to Harris, Cooks mostly talked about killing white people while in prison. Like that was like his thing. That's ah, fucking Cooks talking about killing white people again. Uh, Moore said he also wanted to learn Kung Fu because he'd had bad experiences with white people and, <laughs> and also really wanted to kill them. I don't know why I keep laughing. Just, it's, yeah, okay. Moore would, it's just a weird <laughs> reason, to, I think, to want Kung Fu. Uh, why are you here to learn some Kung Fu? I got to fucking kill as many white people as possible. Oh, okay, well, this should do the trick. Uh, Moore would later deny uh, both asking Harris to teach him Kung Fu and denied uh, hating white people. Cooks would not. In June of 1973, Cooks is released from prison and he quickly gets a job at a Muslim bakery in San Francisco. Starts living in a Muslim halfway house. Uh, he'd set all this up while in prison uh, where the Nation of Islam had a strong presence. So while maybe they disowned members who went to prison on some kind of public level, they didn't entirely disown them. On July 27th, 1973, Anthony Harris is released on parole. He goes to live at the Crittenden House, halfway house in Oakland for recently released prisoners. And he gets a job selling fish for an NOI temple in San Francisco, right? That Temple 26. And he doesn't love the work uh, or the pay for selling fish. So a few weeks later, in August of 73, he goes to Temple 26 to look for a different job. And he meets Larry Craig Green in the Temple Snack Shop. And Larry Green was born in Berkeley, California in 1953, only 20 at the time of the murders. He had had a good childhood, grew up in a middle-class family. Father was a maintenance engineer with the University of California, uh, he and his siblings attended Berkeley High, where he was a, a star basketball player. He studied at Laney and Merritt Community Colleges in the East Bay. He wanted to be in the NBA, like many young people at the time. Uh, he was questioning everything, right? The war, the government, society's expectations of him, religion, everything. According to one of his sisters, he was seeking to establish himself as a man to be respected at a time when black men in general were not respected. And the racism he continually encountered was filling him with indignant rage. He kept a journal where he wrote about his struggles with his purpose, and he felt like the teachings of the NOI, once he found out about him, gave him the purpose he was seeking. Shortly before the murders, uh, Larry dropped out of college, so bye-bye NBA dream, and joined NOI Temple 26. Through the temple, he gets a job with Black Self Help Moving and Storage, an NOI company that offered moving services, storage, and furniture repairs and sales. And the owner of BSH, Thomas Manny, gave jobs to existing NOI members 
or those interested in joining the NOI. Uh, also gave jobs to men, you know, recently released from prison to help them get a uh, fresh start. Anthony Harris, Larry Green spoke about getting a job for Harris. Green drove Harris to Black Self Help and introduced him to Manny, who gave Harris a job cleaning the store. Harris now meets future zebra killer JCX Simon at BSH, BSH, uh, who was employed as an assistant manager. No idea what JC or X stands for in his name. I think his name just was JCX. Every source lists JCX Simon, even like a, 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 you know, an obituary. Uh, Simon was originally from Opelousas, Louisiana. Or excuse me, Opa. Opelousas, Louisiana, a predominantly black small city just north of Lafayette. And is described as a handsome young African-American man in his late 20s. In sources, he attended college briefly in Tyler, Texas. When Simon dropped out of college, he lived a transient lifestyle, got married at some point, had a kid with his wife, left them for another woman, repeated this pattern in San Francisco. Simon was described as a person who was dissatisfied with life in general, and that dissatisfaction expressed itself in anger. The other employees at Black Self Help Moving and Storage were Clarence Jamerson, Edward Land, Douglas Burton, Dwight Stallings, Sylvester Bounds, and Charles Gillespie. And some of them will come up in the timeline. All reportedly connected to the Death Angels. Uh, if they weren't just, you know, death angels themselves, all the BSH, BSH, I don't know why I don't like saying that acronym, uh, employees and their wives or girlfriends were also either members of, or in the process of becoming members of NOI temple 26. After two or three weeks on the job, Harris transitioned from cleaning to helping green move and deliver furniture. Green owned a white or beige 1971 Dodge van, kept quilted moving pads to protect furniture inside the van. Uh, green's van, uh, was the only van used at BSH and will be used in many of the zebra killings. Simon owned an old white four-door Dodge Dart that also will be identified in the killings. In November of 1973, he sold the car to Green but continued to drive it. Manny owned a 1959 black Cadillac that he kept at the store and a Cadillac will show up at some of the murders. Never positively identified as you know being Manny's, but I don't know. Uh, Simon would often drive this car. Harrison Moore could uh, not drive and did not own any vehicles. Harrison Green became close friends and Green often gave him rides. Moore and Simon worked together. Simon often gave more rides. So they're all intertangled. In April of 1973, Green rents an apartment at 844 Grove Street uh, in San Francisco, lives there until he's arrested in May 1st, 1974. On uh, May of 1973, J.C.X. Simon separates from his wife, Ada Simon, and moves in with Green. In August of 1973, Simon rents his own apartment in the same building as Green, lives there until he's arrested in the spring of 74. Harris lives in Oakland until mid-October of 73. Uh, he then moved in with Carolyn Patton, his fiance, lived on Hilltop Road, in San, Hilltop Road in San Francisco. On October 23, 1973, Harris and Carolyn get married. Uh, Green was his best man. Simon gave Carolyn away. And then the marriage would only last 17 days. These guys, are, these guys are living fast lives. November 11th or 12th, 1973, Manuel Moore is released from prison and goes to live at the same Muslim halfway house as Jesse Lee Cook's. Uh, that dude who wanted to break white people's necks, punch their eyes out, break their heads, and bust their hearts. Moore was hired at BSH when he was released from prison. Cooks uh, was not employed at BSH, but was often seen at the store for BSH. On December 19th, 1973, Moore moves in with Simon. Uh, he was in the process of becoming an NOI member, and Simon tried to teach him how to read and write to help him with that. And okay, now. Uh, that that all, all the information has been given. Now let's get into the timeline of the murders themselves. We have met some of the killers, figured out why they were killing. Pretty easy to understand their motivation, right? San Francisco at the time of the killings was still a very racist city and the Nation of Islam was, you know, preaching some very extreme ways in the Bay Area to combat that racism. Uh, they'd warped some young dudes' minds into thinking they understood why white people in San Fran and elsewhere were racist. They were evil, right? Born evil and they needed to die. They were made to be evil by Yakub the scientist and his 59,999 followers some 6,000 years ago. They were grafted, magically bred by fucking big head dumb fuck into becoming heinous beings, literally created to control and oppress God's chosen people, black people who used to live in paradise before Yakub, the old big noggin dude, ruined all that with his white devil Frankenstein bullshit. But I guess he really did it to help perfect black men later. So it's all part of a weird master plan. And now... It's time to kick in the next phase of that master plan. It's time to rise up, start a race war, a race war that will end with the death of all white devils and restore the world to the true heaven on earth situation it used to be for all of Allah's faithful, new and improved black followers, right? And Allah needed angels, death angels to help make this happen, to bring about a new world order, 
right? It's always that story too. Uh, the, 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 the deity is never strong enough to do it themselves. They gotta, they need help. You gotta, you gotta fucking help them push things forward. So while these killings would of course appear super random to the police investigating them, there actually wasn't anything random about them, right? They were part of a plan, a strange fucked up plan concocted by what I feel like was a cult within the nation of Islam, uh, a death angel cult. Just don't have enough info on them about how they treated their members exactly to toss out that cult label with certainty. Here we go. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. The first victims of the zebra killers, or at least the first victims that would be brought up at their trial, uh, were attacked Saturday, October 20th, 1973. There may have been, you know, uh, many other victims prior to this. So much speculation that other death angels killed a lot of other people in the Bay Area going back to at least 1970. And others will die during the same time frame who I will not mention in the timeline. These are just the attacks that the zebra killers uh, will be charged with. 28-year-old Keita Haig and her 30-year-old husband, Richard fucking yes, more dick, go out for an evening walk near their home in the neighborhood of Telegraph Hill. Keita and Richard have been married for seven years. Uh, Richard was a mining engineer who worked for a Utah-based oil company. And Keita was reported with a small paper in South San Francisco. And on October 20th, Death Angels, Jesse Cooks, Larry Green, and future informant Anthony Harris kidnap Richard and Keita. Uh, the plot for their murders had begun months earlier. According to Harris, in the upper floor of the BS, BSH store on Market Street, there was a large meeting room where the Death Angels would meet. In August and September of 73, Harris later said he attended four meetings in this room. Simon, Green, Land, Stallings, others attended the meetings to hear a, a speaker or leader. At one meeting, they watched a film of the Watts Riot in LA, which showed police officers beating black people. Uh, getting, you know, riled up for getting motivated to go, uh, you know, make things right. In October of 73, Harris and Green visited Cooks in his apartment. Uh, Green drove them there in his van. And then Cooks, old fucking punch Whitey's eyes out, uh, asked Harris to get him a gun. Harris reportedly said he would have to get it himself. And Cooks then asked Harris if he wanted to go out and kill some people with him. And Harris initially declined. Cooks then left the room. When he came back, he had a gun. Green now suggested they use his van to go out and make some hits. Cooks wanted to know where they should go to take some people. Harris said he didn't know the city that well. Green said he did know the city and they should go with him. Cooks and Harris now leave with Green, get in the van. Cooks had a 22 caliber pistol and was talking about killing white people, which is classic Cook. That's, that's just fucking Cooks being Cooks. Always talking about killing white people. Uh, back in San Francisco in the early 70s, you could count on three things. Death, taxes, and Jesse Cooks talking about killing the fuck out of some white folks. Uh, the trio drove around the city for three hours, but didn't hurt anybody that night. Still in October, Harris attends two more Death Angel meetings in Simon's apartment. Green drives him there and in the van. Uh, Simon Green, Clarence Jamerson, Edward Land, Dwight Stallings attend the meetings. Cooks, for whatever reason, does not attend. You know, he, he didn't need to go to all the meetings. He didn't need uh, more convincing to kill white people. He was, he was fucking ready in that department. Simon was the main speaker at these meetings usually. And he asked Harris how he felt about white people. If he thought they were the enemy. And if Harris's mind was together enough to destroy the enemy, Green apparently said uh, nothing at these meetings. According to Harris, later, Simon quoted some Nation of Islam lessons about killing the white devil, had a binder with obscure, at least presently obscure, NOI literature and material used to process a person for NOI membership. Uh, some of his material included references to white people as devils, right, needed to be killed. At the second meeting, Simon talked directly about killing white people in real, we're going to fucking do this soon terms. He asked Harris again if his mind was together, if he was ready to kill somebody. And then Simon went into his room, retrieved a large case containing two long knives and three handguns, a 357 Magnum, 38 stub nose, and a 32 caliber automatic pistol. Simon picked up the 32, said Harris could use that to kill some white people. Harris said he didn't need a gun, said he would use his hands. And then Simon told Harris, ah, you're not ready. On October 20th, Anthony, never fucking ready to kill white devils, Harris Spends a day working at Black Self Help, moving to storage, and he leaves work right after 6 p.m. Cooks and Green also leaving. Uh, Harris walks to the bus stop to go home as Harris is waiting. Green and Cooks drive up in Green's van, offer him a ride. But instead of taking him home, Green now drives him around the city. Harris asks where they're going after noticing that Cooks has a 22 caliber, uh, 22 caliber pistol uh, hiding in his boot and a fucking machete next to the driver's seat. Oh, boy. After driving around for a while, Cooks asked Harris if he has his mind together and is ready to kill somebody. Cooks told Harris that he had to kill someone, but Harris said he couldn't do it. And Cooks apparently responded now with just, okay, 
<laughs> I love little moments like this. Real life dialogue, almost never what it is in the movies, right? In the movies, cooks would probably be like, you don't have a choice, motherfucker. It's them or us. And, and then he'd like put a gun to Harris's head. You either get your mind right, you get your mind together, or I'm going to splatter that mind all over this fucking white devil death van, you dig? But in real life, he's just like, oh, all right, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 no problem. Now, nah, it's a big decision. And, you know, look, I don't want to pressure you into doing something you're going to regret, you know, or anything. Uh, the trio drives for a while now until Cooks finally tells Green to park the van near a school on Francis Street in southwest San Francisco. Cooks and Green leave the van. Harris stays inside. Cooks and Green approach a house where three white kids are playing in the front yard. 12-year-old Michelle Carrasco and then Marie and Frankie Stewart, ages not listed in sources. When Frankie comes down the steps, Cooks grabs him around the neck while Green grabs Michelle and Marie. Uh, now uh, they force the three terrified children towards the van. Harris opens the doors, exits the van. Uh, he runs towards Frankie, he will say later, pushes him to the ground, tells Cooks to let him go because he's going to tell his parents. It's just, okay. How do you tell his parents, though, if he was taken? Uh, Frankie, though, does run and yells, cops. The girls also take the opportunity now to run. They run to a rectory where a priest takes them in and calls the police. Green, Cooks, and Harris flee the scene, driving to Broadway in north in the North Beach area of San Francisco. I can't imagine Jesse Cooks was too fucking happy with Anthony Harris. But, you know, maybe he didn't do much about it, right? What the fuck, Anthony? You just let those white devils get away. What are you thinking? I don't know. I just don't think that we should have killed those kids, Jesse. <sighs> Okay, okay, no, I get it. That's fine, that's fine. Uh, Cooks now tells Green to park on the north side of Chestnut Street near the intersection of Powell Street, and they wait. Later that evening, 30-year-old Richard and 28-year-old Keita Haig go out for a walk. It's 9.30 p.m. They walk on the south side of Chestnut Street towards Powell. Richard's carrying a wallet with 10 or 11 bucks, credit cards, a key, and a small fruit knife. Harris later testified that when they saw the couple walking, Cooks opened the side door of the van, got out, ordered Harris to get out as well, and then Green got out. Cooks and Green now cross the street towards the couple. Harris follows from a distance. According to uh, Richard's testimony later, as he and Keita walk down the street, they see two black men standing next to a board fence along a vacant lot. As they approach, one of the men moves to the curbside, forcing them to walk in between them. The man next to the curb is bald. Richard later identifies him as Jesse Cooks in court. Richard and Anthony Harris both later testify that Cooks now grabs Richard's arm, says something like, you're come with us in the van. Get into the van. And then Richard's like, I don't want to. And then Cooks is like, ah, oh, okay, I get it. I mean, a lot of people don't want to go in advance. No, just have, have a nice life. Uh, no, Cooks pulls out a gun and holds it against Richard's back. Richard said that the other man, Green, pointed a pistol at him as well. And how fucking terrifying, right? You're just going out for a walk with your spouse. Love of your life. It's a nice fall evening. The high that day was 70 degrees, right? It was probably in the mid 60s, still at 930. You just out on a walk in your neighborhood. One moment, a walk you, you've probably gone on dozens of times before. And now you have a couple dudes with guns telling you and your wife to get into a fucking van. Harris later testified that he told Keita to run, but Cooks told him to shut up or he'll do me a job. Not entirely sure what he meant by that, but I'm guessing he was ready to kill Anthony if Anthony kept fucking up their white devil assassination plans. Keita uh, does now start running down the street yelling, oh my God, this can't be true. Cooks puts a uh, gun against Richard's head now, tells Keita if she doesn't come back, he's going to kill her husband. According to Harris, Richard now tells his wife, they already have us. Let's cooperate and they won't hurt us. Richard is under the impression that they're being robbed. And if they cooperate, they'll be released. Which is not a crazy assumption. I mean, it's not like he would assume, hmm, what's happening here? Oh, I bet these guys are some nation of Islam death angels who come to kill us so they can help bring about an all-black New World Order paradise situation. Okita <laughs> does come back now and is forced into the van with Richard. Richard sees Green now sitting in the driver's seat with one hand covering his face. He's ordered to lay down uh, with his hands, you know, towards the back of, uh, of the van. He notices quilted pads used by furniture movers. According to Harris, while Cooks is forcing Richard inside the van, Keita attempts to let air out of the tires. I don't know how exactly she did that. It just says attempts to let air out of the tires. Cook now grab, Cooks now grabs her by the hair, slaps her, calls her some, quote, derogatory names, and pushes her into the van. He orders her to lay down in the same position as Richard. Immediately after all this happens, an SFPD police car approaches the van. Two officers ask if anything is wrong. Cook says everything's all right, and they're just having some tire trouble. And the officers drive away, and Harrison Cooks uh, get inside, and Green Drought drives away. So too bad Richard and Keita were not able to scream for help or were too afraid to. Excuse me. Uh, once they start driving, Cook straddles Richard's body. Harris straddles Keita's body. Cooks ties Richard up with a cord. Then he ties up Keita's hands behind her back. 
Next, Cooks goes through uh, Richard's pockets, takes out his wallet, his knife. He tries to talk to Keita, but Cooks tells him to shut up. Uh, and now Richard refuses to be quiet. So Cooks grabs a blunt object, hits Richard in the head repeatedly until he loses consciousness. Keita now refuses to be quiet. So Cooks hits her in the back of the head with his gun. And Richard will not remember much of the, uh, you know, uh, the evening after, you know, he got knocked out. Makes sense. According to Harris's testimony, Green drives them to the docks. And now Cooks asks Harris if he is uh, willing to rape a white woman. Harris said that that's against the teachings of Islam. So now Cooks asks Green if he wants to rape Keita. And he says no. Uh, Keita tells him to, quote, go ahead and rape her and to take all of her belongings, but begs them not to kill her. Cooks now fondles her, orders Harris to choke her out, but he refuses. Then, according to some sources, Cooks now rapes her. Retired San Francisco police sergeant Lou Calibro was on patrol that night uh, and later remembered they molested her, they raped her, and they eventually decapitated her. Yes. Green now drives him to a dark industrial area near some railroad tracks, parks near a concrete wall. According to Harris, it seemed like two cars, a Lincoln Mark III and a Cadillac, were following them and stopped about a half block away. And some sources seem to uh, assume that these are some other Death Angel members or Death Angel leadership, making sure that they're doing their job. Cooks and Green get out of the van, followed by Harris. Green grabs Keita uh, by the hair, pulls her out, throws her on the ground, then raises the machete over his head and, quote, started slicing and chopping away at the woman's neck. Afterwards, Green walked over to Harris and said, you ought, to have see- you ought to have seen all the blood gushed out of that devil's neck. Damn. He offered Keita's wedding ring to Harris, who refused to take it. Cooks then pulled Richard out, started whacking him with a machete. Cooks then offers Harris the machete, who refuses to take it. Harris is busy watching the cars nearby. He sees flashing lights as if someone's taking pictures. Interesting. Cooks then uh, hits Richard again, does not stop until Harris tells him that he has to be dead. And now they all drive away and go to Harris's apartment to clean up and clean the van. Green gives Harris the ring again, tells him to give it to his fiance, Carolyn. And apparently now Harris does take it and does give it to Carolyn. Maybe that's why uh, their marriage only lasted 17 days. Maybe she found out, you know, where he got that fucking ring. At 11 p.m., witness John Battenberg and his wife see Richard Haig, still alive, staggering out of the darkness with his hands tied behind his back. He unties Richard and drives him to a police station Uh, Battenberg notices severe wounds on Richard's face, neck, and head. And then an ambulance picks Richard up at the police station and takes him to the hospital. And I cannot for the life of me understand like why they didn't drive him to the hospital first. Uh, Oh my God, is is this guy alive? How? Someone's hacked him all to shit. Uh, Hurry, uh, get him in the car. We got to drive him to the police station. I hear they have a lot of bandages there. Officers uh, go to the train tracks where Richard was found, locate the cord used to tie him up. And then another, another officer finds his wife, you know, Keita Haig's body on the railroad track. Uh, her head had nearly been severed from her body. Detective Prentice Earl Sanders later writes about seeing Keita at the autopsy table. He wrote, I've been in the department almost 10 years by the time the Haig's were attacked. I worked in radio cars and on vice with robbery and homicide. In nine years, you see a lot. Knifings, shootings, beatings, strangulations, pretty much any way you can kill a person. I'd seen it done but I'd never seen anything like the wounds that cut through that young woman. They took your breath away. It was like looking at a painting that had been hacked at by some madman, the beauty torn and shredded right there in its frame. Damn, that is brutal. And also, Sanders is an excellent writer. I mean, that was dark as shit, but he really painted a uh, a picture there, a dramatic picture. Sanders uh, stood in the autopsy room with white homicide detectives staring at Kita, who they knew, uh, he said, he said that they knew that yeah, had been murdered by black men. He later said that the idea of a racially motivated murder immediately came to his mind, but he didn't say anything because of the existing tensions and who was in the room. Sanders said he wondered, maybe the killers weren't after the Hagues specifically, but people like the Hagues, white people. And he knew that acknowledging that possibility would have, uh, you know, worsened the tensions within the department. The day after this attack, Sunday, October 21st, 1973, Officers were now on the lookout for the white Dodge van described by Richard Haig, right? That poor bastard. He must've felt horrible about not encouraging his wife to keep running after she had initially gotten away. Not that he could have known what was going to happen, but still also what a tough son of a bitch hacked by a psycho repeatedly with a machete, not only lives, but is able to give the police details about his attackers within hours of being attacked. 
At 11.30 p.m., two officers pull over a van at Steiner and O'Farrell Streets, and it's the right van, driven by Death Angel Larry Green. The officers arrest him on on an outstanding traffic warrant, but Thomas Manny, the owner of Black Self-Help Moving and Storage, pays his bill, gets him out, and Green, after being arrested, is not even questioned about the murders from the night before. Don't know why. Back in the days before computerized criminal databases, you know, it was so much easier to get away with so much more. Another attack occurs just two days later. Kind of. On October 23rd, 1973, at 8.30 p.m., 27-year-old Linda Lou Enger is walking to her apartment on Waller Street near the local University of California Extension campus. Uh, She realized a man was following her, so she took her keys out of her purse, ran to her apartment building entrance. Before she could open the door, a man later identified as Jesse Cooks, of course, uh, grabs her arm, holds a gun to her neck. He tells her to be quiet or he'll kill her, so she does what he asks. He now forces Linda to walk down the street with him, telling her to put her arm around his neck like their boyfriend and girlfriend. They walk to a parking lot under a freeway where Cooks makes her remove a raincoat because he says it's too conspicuous. So uh, she puts the coat, her purse, and her briefcase in a bush. Cooks now holds a gun in his hand instead of against Linda's body, and they walk to a nearby park and sit and talk. Linda told Cooks that she had attended a meeting at the Unitarian Church, and, you know, uh, uh, what is fucking happening here? They, They talk about her church for a while. Cooks is so weird. Uh, Cooks then forces her to walk to a vacant lot at the corner of Buchanan and Page where he orders her to sit in some bushes. Okay, and they uh, and they talk for another half hour, just, you know, about life. Linda Lou is fucking smooth. Cool under pressure. Clearly impressive. Uh, Cooks asks her if she's going to call the police. Linda says she's not going to. Cooks says he doesn't believe her and he threatens to kill her. When he points to two spots on her forehead, says if he shoots her there, she'll die immediately and uh, he'll be long gone before anyone finds her. Linda Lou. Still doesn't freak out. She keeps talking to him, steering the conversation now to social issues of the day. They talk about environmental issues, the war in Vietnam, the oppression of black people in America. Uh, Cook said it was time to put an end to that sort of thing, referring to the oppression of black people. He says the world has to be changed and people are going to be killed and the streets are going to be lying with blood. People are going to be killed indiscriminately and there was no use to be afraid or upset by it. Linda Liu still does not freak out. Now she tries to tell him that killing people was not the right thing to do. During another hour or so of conversation, Cook threatens to kill her 10 to 15 more times. Eventually, fucking cool hand Linda changes the subject uh, again, uh, gets it back away from murder, seems to calm Cooks down. The two end up walking back to the bush where she stashed her shit. <laughs> they retrieve her things. And then Cooks walks her back to her apartment, makes sure she gets in inside safe and leaves. Just just leaves. Just like, oh, okay, I, you know, I could tell you didn't want to be killed, so I'll, I'm going to take off. Uh, Once inside, Linda calls a friend and then calls the police. Two days later, Cooks calls her. Uh, She gave him her number at some point and asked her why she wasn't at her apartment the night before when he stopped by. Dude's fucking checking up on her. Uh, Linda Lou should be in some kind of Hall of Fame. Like, it seems like she made this guy who hates white people, talks about killing them all the time, fall in love with her or something. Hail Linda Lou. Uh, Fucking white devil tricknology 101. Fucking crafty ass white people. Good job, big head, Yakub. You really gave us some solid manipulative powers. Well, Linda Lou tells Cooks that she wasn't home the night before because she was scared of him. And now he asked her if she went to the police and she's like, no. And Cook then asked her if she wants to be left alone. <laughs> and she says that she does. And he hangs up. And just he doesn't bother her again. What the hell? Did not expect something like that to happen in this story. Well, a, a week later, fucking all over the place, Cooks is back at it. He's not interested in talking this time. No more falling for white devil technology bullshit. October 30th, 1973, 28-year-old Francis Rose, a physical therapy student, is murdered while driving up to the entrance gate of the University of California Extension. A man had blocked her car's path and demanded a ride, and when she refused, he repeatedly shot her. Francis was shot four times in the chest, neck, and face. A witness who lived in an apartment across the street said that the gunman was a 25-year-old black man uh, wearing a, a navy blue watch cap, Light pants, a Greek, uh, excuse me, Greek, a Greek jacket and gloves. He was wearing a, you know, a Greek jacket. Uh, I can't even, I can't even picture what that was supposed to look like. No, a green jacket. Cooks was arrested just five minutes later. The officers who responded to the scene found him just walking along Steiner Street like he hadn't just shot somebody. And Cooks, he doesn't even try to deny what he did. He immediately is like, yeah, I killed her. He said that he, he said that Francis offered him a ride. He said he got into the car and he got angry when she started calling him racial slurs. So, you know, uh, he shot her and then he just, he, he fled. Cooks was clearly not a real mentally stable individual, not a criminal mastermind. 
Two weeks later, November 12th, the grand jury votes to have the DA indict him. Cooks is charged with murder, being an ex-felon with a firearm, uh, rape, kidnapping, and performing an unnatural sexual act. Uh, separate victims here. The grand jury learned that Cooks recently followed a 26-year-old woman from a bus stop and forced her to walk to a vacant lot where he raped her. And then he forced her to go to her apartment where he raped her again. And then he just fucking left uh, like that was not going to come back to haunt him. This, this crazy fucker didn't give a shit about uh, any version of Islamic teachings. He just, you know, he just wanted to hurt people and he, he was all over the place. Uh, Cooks will eventually be convicted of the murder of Francis Rose. It'll take months to connect Cooks to the Keita Haig case. Meanwhile, the other employees at BSH have more meetings in November of 1973. Cooks being gone doesn't mean that the uh, call to action is over. Paradise must still be restored. More white devils still need to die. A lot more. Still got to, still got to, you know, clean up Yakub's mess. Manuel Moore, JCX Simon, Larry Green, Clarence Jamerson, Edward Land, Anthony Harris, and Dwight Stallings are present at these meetings. Uh, Simon asks Harris if he can kill anybody. This first one, he asks uh, if he's got his mind together and his feelings, uh, what they are on white people. Simon tells Harris he will have to kill someone to prove he can be trusted. Harris said he uh, would not kill anyone because no one had hurt him. And then Simon, disappointed now, said, man, you still haven't got yourself and got yourself together yet. This guy, this guy, these guys are obsessed with Harris getting his mind together. Well, Harris said that Simon often talked about the death angels. According to Simon, if a person wanted to join the death angels, you know, you got to kill the four white kids or the five white women or the nine white men. You know, his literature in his binder contained this information. Simon doesn't specifically uh, say he wanted Harris to kill who he wanted to, uh, Harris to kill, but, you know, insists that it has to be some white people. November 25th now, 53-year-old Salim Arakat is murdered inside his grocery store. Uh, Salim was a Palestinian Arab who had moved to the U.S. in the late 1950s. He was light-skinned, and since Middle Eastern is not African, the poor bastard counted as being a white devil. He operated a small family grocery store on Larkin Street, a working-class immigrant neighborhood. Salim was murdered a little after 11 a.m., the safe and the cash register had been emptied. Salim's watch was missing. I'm not sure that was part of the NOI teachings. Maybe. Uh, his pockets were turned inside out. Uh, Salim was killed execution style. Hands tied behind his back. Shot in the head with a 32 caliber gun. A quilt padding used by movers was found at the scene with nine bullet holes in it. Most likely used to muffle gunshots. Witnesses said they saw a black man with a briefcase outside the store around the time of the shooting. There was a bloody palm print at the scene that could not be identified. 32 caliber bullets were found at the scene. Uh, Harris, it was his palm print that would be found on the doorknob inside the room where Salim was murdered. The informant will later testify to this. According to Harris's testimony, he called Simon to ask if there was any work for him that day. Simon told him he could come to BS, BSH to clean. Simon offered to pick him up because he had the key to the store. Harris asked him to pick him up at the YMCA two blocks from Salim's store. Simon and Eddie Land picked Harris up. Simon drove around for a while, then stopped on Larkin Street, told Harris to go across the street. Uh, they'd stop directly across from Salim's store. Now Simon and Land drive around the block to park, then return to Salim's store. Harris couldn't see anyone inside the store, walked in there. Simon came in through the back door, told him not to let anyone else in. Harris turned away a man who tried to come into the store. A woman came, asked for Mr. Salim. Harris told her uh, she's, he's not there. A moment later, Harris says he hears a loud noise in the back, goes to the back room, sees Simon and Land standing over a man who was bleeding on the floor. The three men checked to make sure no one was following them and then fled the scene. Later that day, a bus driver found Salim's wallet in the back of a bus. Uh, Salim's credit cards were scattered on the floor of the bus. He told the police that two black men had gotten on his bus earlier that day. Uh, was that done for Allah or did they just want some money? The following month, December 1973, while at BSH, Manuel Moore tells JCX Simon that he wants to join the Death Angels. They've been hanging around for a while. As we know, now he wants officially in. In another conversation, Larry Green tells Harris uh, he will not join because it involves too much killing. Uh, you know, he just, uh, and Harris tells Green that he isn't going to join either, right? Because he can't get his fucking mind right. He can't get his mind together. Thomas Manny, Simon, Moore, Green, Jamerson, Land, and Burton later testify uh, and deny ever discussing murdering white people. Simon testified that Harris was never at his apartment. Other witnesses testified that they had never seen Harris in Simon's apartment or in the building. Green testified that he never took Harris to his or anyone else's apartment, but that Harris did visit him at his apartment a few times after he's married. I mean, who's telling the truth here? I will never know the full, complete story. Uh, I will say I'm not sure I, uh, you know, always buy informant Harris's story about he never wants to kill anybody, but just happens to keep getting invited out on more missions to kill people. I, I think he's probably way more involved in all of this than he would later admit to, but that's just what I think. 
Uh, Harris will quit working at BSH a few months later, February 1st, 1974. He'll move to Oakland to be with his uh, now wife, Deborah Turner. And who the fuck is she? I don't know. He was married to Carolyn Patton back in October. And by February, he's got a new wife. Again, life moving fast for these NOI warriors. Uh, Harris later claimed he feared he was going to be killed if he did not leave BSH. Back to late 1973. December 11th, 26-year-old Paul Danzig is murdered while talking at a payphone. Around 9.45 p.m., he stopped to use a phone in front of an apartment complex on Haight Street. While he's talking, a man approaches him, shoots him three times in the chest. Witnesses describe seeing two black men in their 20s at the scene. 32 caliber bullets are found at the scene, almost always with 32. According to Harris, he's standing at the bus stop on Haight Street when Simon and Moore drive up in a Cadillac owned by Thomas Manny and offer him a ride. Simon then drove uh, them to, quote, the projects on Haight Street. He and Moore then left the car, told Harris to wait. He said he saw Moore walk into uh, some bushes near a public phone at the entrance of the apartment complex. Simon stopped at the end of the car. Harris heard a gunshot, and then Simon ran back to the car. Moore then ran out of the bushes to the car, and Simon sped off and dropped Harris off at a store a few blocks away, told him he'd have to get home on his own. Two days later, December 13th, 9.45 p.m., 31-year-old Marietta D. Girolamo is murdered while walking along uh, Divisadero Street. A man shoved her into a doorway, shot her twice in the chest. People witnessed the shooting, but assumed before the shots were fired that Marietta and the man were just arguing. A witness in court later identifies the shooter as Clarence Jamerson. Uh, Marietta, not the first victim of the day, 36-year-old Art Agnos was later shot while standing on a sidewalk after a meeting. Agnos, future mayor of San Francisco, was then a member of the California Commission on Aging, and he had attended a meeting in uh, Potrero Hill. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss building a government-funded health clinic in the area. At 8.20 p.m., he had just finished a meeting with residents at a public housing development in Potrero Hill. He parked nearby. On his way to his car, he got held up talking to people from the meeting. And as he was speaking to two women, he saw them suddenly look past him. They seemed alarmed. He was about to turn his head when he heard a sound like firecrackers and simultaneously felt something hit him in his back. And at first, he thought it was somebody elbowing him. The women ran off looking terrified. And then Agnos ran off after them, telling them not to worry. It's just firecrackers. Uh, and then they told him that he had been shot and he turned around, saw a young man standing and staring at him with a gun in his hand. When the man ran away, Agnos now started to feel the blood running down the back of his shirt. When he left the meeting, right, uh, it's fucking, uh, you know, he was badly injured, sorry, uh, but he would survive and 32 caliber bullets will be found at the scene. And it's crazy that it took him a second to realize he was shot. Like so weird how the body and mind react to injury sometimes. Uh, Agnos' spleen, colon, and kidneys were severely injured. So much so, it took him a year to recover. Seven days later, another attack. December 20th, 1973, 8 p.m. 81-year-old Ilario uh, Bertuccio was murdered while walking home from work in the Bayview District. Fuck, first off, come on. I feel bad that this 81-year-old is walking home from work and not enjoying his retirement. And then second, this employed 81-year-old man just so senselessly murdered, right? He's he's fucking 81. He's going to probably die soon anyway. You, You don't need to help Allah with this one. Alario worked as a handyman at the 7-Up Bottling Plant in, Bay- in the Bayview District. He lived less than half a mile from the plant. He walked home every night. Uh, never felt like he had a reason to be afraid. Alario was shot four times in the shoulder and chest. Died almost instantly. And I imagine he died so fucking utterly confused. One witness saw Alario laying on the ground shortly after being shot. And he saw a black man running down the street to a vehicle that looked like a white Dodge Dart. Like JCX Simons. White Dart. Another black man sitting in the car. Uh, the witness later testif- or, excuse me, later identified Manuel Moore and Simon in a police lineup. And these killers not done for the day. At 10 p.m., 21-year-old Teresa DiMartini was parking her car on Central Street behind Grove and Fulton. She noticed a white car double parked at Central and Grove. The driver was a black man. The car looked like a Dodge Dart. The second man walked to the white car. They watched her as she got out. As she was locking up her car, one of the men approached her, shot her three times. Fourth shot shattered the driver's side window, and then the man fled the scene. Teresa laid on the street calling for help. A large black, uh, a large, excuse me, a large car uh, backed out of a driveway now straight towards her. She rolled under the car so she wouldn't be run over. A witness heard the gunshots and screaming, saw a Cadillac with two black men inside back out of a driveway and almost run her over. Fucking Cadillac showing up again. Death Angel leadership, maybe, making sure these guys are killing the right people uh, or just other unnamed Death Angels. Teresa said the shooter looked to be 26 years old, about six feet tall. She assisted with drawing a composite sketch. 
May of 1974, she identified the shooter as Manuel Moore. And the police found more 32 caliber bullets at the scene fired by the same gun in the Salim Ericat, uh, Ilario Bertuccio, and Paul Danzig murders. And just another fucking tough meat sack. My God, just shot numerous times, almost ran over, and then like, oh yeah, sure, I'll help you, that, uh, help you do that sketch. Yeah, no, I'm fine. Uh, just two days later, on December 22nd, 1973, the Death Angels murdered two more victims, 19-year-old Neil uh, Monahan and 50-year-old Mildred Hostler. Both die within a few minutes of each other. At 8, 10 p.m., Neil was murdered while out shopping and walking near the Civic Center. He had just purchased a fucking teddy bear as a Christmas gift for his little sister. Damn it. He was carrying the bear inside a paper bag while he walked down the street. And then a man just walked in front of him, just quickly shot him in the face, neck and heart. Uh, the killer then chased Mildred Hostler as she was walking to the bus stop, shot her five times. 32 caliber shell casings found at both crime scenes from the same gun as the previous murders. Detective Sander and Guilford respond to the crime scenes. Witnesses describe seeing a thin young man with long black hair and a pale complexion uh, made him look racially ambiguous. What? Did a white devil or half devil sneak into the Death Angels? Actually, I do wonder with situations like this, like how do they handle shit like that? I mean, some people can be more than 50% white genetically, but look predominantly black. I think this just like illustrates like just uh, more evidence of how dumb racism is. Like, I wonder how many racists are unknowingly made up of a, of a pretty large percentage of the race they claim to hate. Around 8.20 p.m. on the 22nd, Detective Sanders and Guilford and Herman Clark, a robbery inspector, went out driving looking for a light colored Dodge Dart seen near the shootings. Guilford noticed a car matching the description. They follow the car to Hickory Street where the passenger gets out and flees. They follow the man to an apartment at 844 Grove Street where they then question uh, Simon, JCX Simon, who said he had been alone for the past half hour and had just come from black self-help. And for reasons I don't understand, they don't bring him in for more questioning. Why not? I No idea. Maybe, maybe he had been studying up on some white devil tricknology himself and was able to fuck I, you know, fucking Jedi mind trick uh, these white devils with their own black magic. I don't know. December 24th, 1973, the police discovered the body of a white John Doe in the Ocean Beach District at Pacheco or Pacheco Beach. Uh, the body had been bound and butchered, missing hands, feet, and head. Another zebra killing, as police will later learn. That evening, Sanders and Guilford are leaving an interview with the suspect in the Fillmore neighborhood when they see a Dodge Dart like the one they'd lost the night before. Uh, Gil follows the dart, pulls the driver over. The driver's a young, thin, pale black man. In the passenger seat uh, is uh, another black man with a cold, scowling face, JCX Simon, the dude they just questioned two days earlier. The uh, driver steps out, is identified as Larry Green. Sanders noticed that he has, you know, uh, you know, pale skin that could make it hard to identify him as a black man, just like the witnesses at the crime scene described from a couple days ago, uh, a couple days prior. Both Sanders and Guilford could sense something's off. Green seems guilty but they don't feel like they have enough evidence to make an arrest. Damn it. Uh, this first wave of murders has now led to widespread panic in the city. By the end of 1973, people in San Francisco are starting to go out in groups, avoid going out at all at night. Uh, the city is ordering increased police protection uh, presence. The SFPD is baffled by the randomness and lack of motive of these killings. Uh, they had established a pattern for most of the killings, you know, hit and run. The shooter generally walked up to the victim shot him at close range, then fled on foot. Uh, killer also strongly preferred a 32 caliber pistol. Detectives Gus Carreras, uh, John Fatinos, those two Greek officers, led a SFPD task force to find the killers, and SFPD chief Donald Scott now assigns that Z police radio channel for them to use exclusively the Zebra channel. As I said earlier, that's how they become uh, known as the Zebra Murders. Uh, and the, it's the Zebra Task Force. So a little over a month later, January 28th, 1974, the Zebra Killers are back at it and they go real big. Four more people are murdered. Two others are wounded. This is just one day, 32 year old Tana Smith shot and killed while walking to a fabric store around 7 35 PM. 69 year old Vincent Wallen shot and killed while walking home 7 55 PM. 80 year old John Bambuck shot and killed while collecting bottles and cans. Damn it. Just after 9 PM. Fucking just picking up some litter. 45-year-old Jane Holly shot and killed while doing her laundry at a laundromat, 9.45 p.m. 26-year-old Thomas Bates, hitchhiking near Emeryville, survives after being shot three times. 23-year-old Roxanne McMillan survives after being shot while carrying items from her car to her apartment, and she will have to use a wheelchair for the rest of her life. 
Uh, there is speculation that these attacks are a response to a police brutality incident three days earlier. January 25th, 1974, a group of black men were driving a van, selling fish door to door as part of a Nation of Islam sanctioned business. The Berkeley police pulled him over for selling fish without a license. When the men object, a fight breaks out. 24-year-old Larry Crosby disarms one of the officers, pistol whips him with his own gun, drops the gun, runs, and then gets shot in the back and paralyzed. Huge protest is held January 26 at Mosque Number 26. Harris, Green, Simon, Cooks, Moore, all there. Uh, later revealed that the Berkeley police were ordered to profile black Muslims attending and generate cause for arrest. Three days later, Simon Moore and Green commit those January 28th shootings. All is now quiet for about two months. But then 19-year-old Thomas Rainwater murdered April 2nd, 1974. Thomas's friend, 21-year-old Linda Story, is also shot but will survive. The two Salvation Army cadets were walking towards the Mayfair Market, two blocks from the Salvation Army School for Officer Training Center. Right, these fucking just trying to help out the world, make it a little better place when the attack occurs. A black man had been following them. He overtook them, uh, turned around, fired four shots and fled. The police responded within 15 seconds. Two of them happened to be near the scene and they initiated a manhunt, but it was unsuccessful. Shell casings found at the scene are yet again from a 32 caliber gun, right? They know the zebra killers have struck again. 12 days later, April 14th, two more victims are attacked. 18 year old Ward Anderson and just 15 year old Terry White, just a kid. Ward and Terry, neither knew the other, were waiting at the uh, bus stop at the corner of Fillmore and Hayes streets when a black man approached on foot, shot him and fled. And they both survived. Of course, Ward survived. Wards are built different. If you know why I say that, well, thanks for being on this ride for a while. Hail, Papa Ward. Two days later, 23-year-old Nelson T. Shields IV is murdered on April 16th. Uh, Nelson, son of a wealthy DuPont exec, had gone out with a friend to pick a, a rug up at a house on Vernon Street in the Ingleside District. He opened up the back of a station wagon, uh, was making room for the rug when he was shot repeatedly and killed. A witness testified that she saw a black man rushing up Vernon Street at the time of the shooting. Like always, the shell casings at the scene are 32 caliber. These motherfuckers just indiscriminately killing people who happen to be white. White people who may have very well been on their side when it came to race relations. It's not like they took the time to ever find out, right? They're not vetting anyone. If you're white, you're evil, and it's a good thing to kill you, period. Except for, you know, cooks and that, and that one woman. <laughs> Maybe he did take a little time there and he let her go. Uh, San Franciscans are more cautious than ever now. The city takes an economic hit due to a huge dip in tourism. The streets are deserted at night. The Death Angels must have been uh, so proud of themselves. Another two days later, April 18th, 1974, Mayor Joseph Alioto. Sorry, I thought, his, I thought his name was Alito and it is spelled with an O in it. So I have no idea how to fuck pronounce it. I felt confident before this uh, recording. Uh, Joseph A L I O T O. Aliato. I don't know. Uh, announces Operation Zebra. SFPD officers were to stop and question large numbers of black citizens who resemble descriptions of the primary suspect. A 25 to 30 year old black man with a short afro and narrow chin, six feet tall, 160 to 180 pounds. Once they were stopped, checked, and cleared, they would receive a zebra check card to show future officers if they were stopped again. Over 500 black men are stopped during the first weekend of this program. And the mayor says at the time, extraordinary situations like this call for extraordinary measures. We are going to be stopping a lot of innocent people who in normal circumstances would have a little resentment. I'm going to appeal to them to cooperate with the police by giving identification. I'm not making a racial issue out of this. All I'm saying is that the victims have all been white. The composite identification of the suspect is black. That's not racist. That's the fact. There are people of my own ethnic background who have given a black eye to all Italian Americans. Ah, the mafiosa, spaghetti bolognese, Tony Soprano. Uh, you get it. Uh, Alioto uh, encouraged people to live their normal lives, but exercise caution, saying, you can't go around acting like frightened kids the rest of your life. I wonder how gun sales are doing at this time. If it's me, and I don't already own and carry a handgun, oh, I sure as fuck do now. Are you kidding me? Give myself a chance to shoot one of these motherfuckers before they shoot me. Alioto uh, makes sure to have Dr. Washington Garner, a black member of the police commission, uh, with him during his speech to appeal for, quote, any member of the black community having knowledge to report it to the police department. He said solving the murders was an individual responsibility of the black citizen. Uh, that, that. He asked black men who were stopped not to resent it, but to show their identification. And ah, I don't know about this. I mean, I get it. But, uh, you know, when there's been a white guy serial killer like Gary Ridgway in the past. Police don't start checking in with all white dudes who might, you know, happen to look a little bit like a police sketch. 
Not that I can recall. I just think if this situation was racially reversed, it would not be handled the same. Uh, Inspector Gus Carreras now has SFPD sketch artist Hobart Nelson draw two composite sketches based on witness descriptions, and the city offers a $30,000 reward for any information that will lead to an arrest. On April 18th, hundreds of young, young black men are stopped, excuse me, uh, searched and questioned right after uh, this is this operation commences, and this is not well received by the black community at all. Reverend Cecil Williams of Glide Church points out that when the Zodiac Killer was active, nobody stopped white men randomly based on his sketch. Exactly. Uh, the ACLU then responds on April 19th. They called the searches a racist outrage and a massive violation of the constitutional rights of every black man in the city. And this all had to have made the killers feel more justified in the stupid shit they were doing. Amitai Schwartz, director of a joint investigation of Northern California police practices with the NAACP and Mexican-American Legal Defense Fund and the Liberties Union, Schwartz was in all fucking kinds of stuff, uh, said, what is essentially happening is that individual policemen with their inevitable racist tendencies are out on the streets with a carte blanche to stop any black man and treat him as they see fit in their own discretion. Uh, U.S. District Judge Alfonso J. Zerpoli would quickly rule the operation unconstitutional based on a lawsuit filed by the NAACP and the ACLU. And the police suspend the operation. And again, I get why they considered doing this, but how is the mayor so tone deaf to already existing racial tensions in the city? How did he not understand that this could make shit so much worse? How did he you know, not consider that if the killings are racially motivated as they sure appear to be, this could lead to a big uptick in racial violence? A few days later, April 22nd, 1974, Anthony Cornelius Harris, right? Former employee at Black Self-Help Moving and Storage calls the San Francisco Police Department. Harris said he called the police to, quote, stop a lot of senseless killing, that's all. And maybe all the shit he's reported so far is true. Maybe he really did go along on a lot of the drives, led to murder, but hated what was being done. He didn't have to make that call. Or maybe he was worried about being arrested and not having any bargaining power or less bargaining power if that happened. And maybe he was also motivated by wanting the $30,000 reward money as sources have alleged. Uh, When he did call, he did so with a lawyer present. And Harris now meets the police in Oakland, claims to be one of the people featured in the sketches, and he provides details never released to the public. He denies killing any victims, but admits to being present at some of the murders. And he is offered total immunity for what he uh, uh, ends up sharing with police. He implicates Cooks, Green, Moore, and Simon in the murder of Keita Haig the John Doe murder I mentioned, and the January 28th shootings. Harris also says that the Death Angels are related to the Nation of Islam security branch, the Fruit of Islam. Fruit of Islam, is that the dumbest name ever for a security team? It just doesn't sound threatening. (laughs) Beware the Fruit of Islam. Like, nah, Fruit just doesn't have a fucking powerful security kind of connotation. Uh, And they're still around. All male members of the Nation of Islam are by default members of the security force. Also sometimes described as a a peri, oh my God paramilitary organization. There you go. How involved they are uh, seems to vary quite a bit from member to member. Well, Harris gives the police a lot of details about the John Doe murder. Says that they abducted a homeless man from Ghirardelli Square. They took this man to the storage warehouse uh, where they gagged and tied him up. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, while he was unconscious, uh, they took turns hacking away his limbs. My God. And then dumped his body into the bay. Harris gave names, dates, addresses, and details. Prosecutors quickly arrested, uh, or excuse me, quickly issued arrest warrants against the suspects. Detective uh, Carrera said of Harris years later, he laid everything out to us. Names, places, crimes committed. He opened up a Pandora's box. A little over a week later, May 1st, 1974, the police execute simultaneous raids and arrest Larry Craig Green and JCX Simon in an apartment at 844 Grove Street. Manuel Moore is arrested at the Black Self-Help Moving and Storage Facility. Thomas Manny, Clarence Jamerson, Douglas Burton, Dwight Stallings, all also arrested. Uh, Mayor Aliotto gave a big speech announcing that the killers who had been terrorized in the city had been caught. He told the public they were death angels, Nation of Islam members who targeted whites. He explained that to be part of their group, they had to show proof of their attacks and and their, their murders to advance and said that they may have killed nearly 80 people. John Muhammad, black Muslim leader and minister of Mosque 26 in San Francisco, was quick to deny that there was any conspiracy to kill whites. He stated there was no such group as the Death Angels. Uh, But then the Nation of Islam paid for attorneys for Green, Moore, and Simon, which, you know, not a good look, maybe. There is no conspiracy regarding some NOI members killing whites. That said, we are going to hire attorneys 
for some of our NOI members who have been butchering whites <laughs> right and left for months. Jesse Lee Cooks pleads guilty before trial. Cooks will also confess to the racial motivation of the murders. The only one who will do so. Uh, Cooks was already sentenced to life in prison for the first October 1973 attack and the rape of uh, that other victim. Later that month, the grand jury for the city and county of San Francisco returned an indictment accusing Cooks, Green, Moore, and Simon of conspiracy to commit murder between October 20th, 1973 and April 30th, 1974. Cook and Green, Cooks and Green, excuse me, also accused of crimes against Keita Haig, kidnapping, robbery, and murder. Uh, rape is not listed in this uh, indictment. Uh, so, I mean, that was said in some sources. I don't know. Maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't. Cooks uh, and Green were accused of crimes against Richard Haig, kidnapping, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon. The indictment alleged that during the robbery of Keita Haig, uh, Green inflicted great bodily injury. During the robbery of Richard Haig, Cooks inflicted a great bodily injury. And Cooks used a firearm while committing the offenses against Richard and Keita. Moore and Simon accused of murdering Tana Smith, Jane Holly, on uh, January 28th, 1974, that especially bloody day. Simon used a firearm to kill Tana Smith. Moore used a firearm to kill Jane Holly. Moore and Simon also accused of assault with a deadly weapon against Roxanne McMillan uh, that same day. And Moore was charged with assault with a deadly weapon against Ward Anderson and Terry White, April 14th, 1974. The defendants plead not guilty, deny all allegations against them. And the killer's trial begins 10 months later, March 3rd, 1975. The defense tries to discredit Harris's informant testimony, but he reveals a ton of details about the shootings that match up with crime scene evidence. The Zebra Task Force also has a smoking gun. They present a 32 caliber Beretta semi-automatic pistol recovered from the backyard of a home near the scene of the last murder. The gun is linked to Thomas Manny, owner of Black Self-Help Moving and Storage, and this is the gun that was used in so many of the murders. In total, 108 witnesses will testify, making it the longest criminal trial in California history. On March 14th, 1976, three killers are convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. March 29th, the four men all sentenced to life in prison under the indeterminate sentencing laws of the time. While the killers were only officially charged with the murders of Tana Smith, Jane Holly, Keita Haig, uh, investigators felt confident that the four men were responsible for 15 murders and eight additional attempted murders between October 20th, 1973 and April 16th, 1974. To try uh, them for all of these uh, you know, crimes, would have made a long and expensive trial longer and more expensive and would not have resulted in a different sentence. Informant Anthony Harris following the trial, he's a free man, granted immunity uh, from all prosecution, and he enters the Federal Witness Protection Program with his family. If he did get that reward money, it was not publicly disclosed. Almost 40 years later, March, 20, uh, March 12th, 2015, 69-year-old death angel J.C.X. Simon is found dead in a cell in San Quentin. He was serving life with the possibility of parole. Simon never did admit to any guilt. He told a parole board in 2007 before he walked out of his own hearing, this is a legal lynching. You're going to lynch me whether I like it or not. You might as well put a rope right on top of the ceiling that's going to let me hang. Dude, come on. After what you did, maybe stop trying to uh, play the victim. It's a pretty fucking weak look at this point. Uh, a little over two years later, November 15th, 2017, 75-year-old death angel Manuel Moore dies at the California Healthcare Facility in Stockton. A few more years later, uh, January 28th, 2020, death angel Jesse Cooks is denied parole. Again, uh, Cooks agreed to postpone his next parole hearing until his 80th birthday in 2025, but he won't live long enough to make it to that hearing. June 30th, 2021, 76-year-old Cooks dies in the prison hospital at the Richard J. Donovan, another fucking dick, correctional facility. He was found unresponsive in the hospice unit. Cooks was the only one to confess to the murders. J.C.X. Simon, Manuel Moore maintained their innocence before the parole board over the years. Larry Green did as well until just recently. Larry Green, the last zebra killer alive, the seven-year-old, is currently serving a sentence at the California State Prison in Vacaville. Uh, Green was last denied parole in the summer of 2019. He's going to have to wait until 2024 for his next review. And he said in August of 2019 that he believed white people were devils when he did what he did. He said he has since realized we're all human beings. Well, better late than never, I guess. Uh, victim Roxanne McMillan said in a written statement at Green's hearing, I'm 69 years old now, but not a day goes by that I am not reminded of how that single violent incident has changed my life. Doing everyday tasks and caring for myself from a wheelchair is becoming increasingly more of a challenge. And that'll take us out of today's timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Barely. 
so what a story, huh? And there may be so much more to it. Something that may have greatly contributed to the zebra murders, in addition to Nation of Islam teachings and a racist police department in San Francisco at the time of the killings, just kind of a racist local culture in general, uh, something I did not mention is gin and jazz. San Francisco had a lot of jazz clubs in the early 70s, and they all served gin, from what I can tell. And we learned in the Leopold and Loeb, perfect murder sucked is how dangerous that combination is. The killers may have very well been suffering from dementia jazz mania at the time of the murders. And because I think it's important to share another PSA. You might know how dangerous jazz is, but do you know how dangerous white jazz is? Be careful. You're listening to some right now. Please make sure you have other noise on in the background. It's too dangerous when not watered down. You're listening to Big Spiderbeck play I'm Coming Virginia in 1927. Spiderbeck was a white devil from Iowa. A white devil jazz musician. A master of technology. A deadly gift given to him by Big Head Yakub. A master of manipulation who used his evil cornet to Pied Piper listeners directly into murder. Can you not hear the death? I beg you, listen closely. Kill all the white people. Bring back paradise. Do it for the jazz. All white devils must die. Kill all the white devils who smell like bologna and old hot dogs. That's the smell of evil. Drink the gin. Drink the gin. And you will understand your true purpose. Dementia jazz mania is real. And white devil dementia jazz mania is the most dangerous kind of jazz mania there is. If I would have just played some Kenny G, <laughs> you'd already be fucked up on Tangare and stabbing some motherfucker. If you or someone you know has a jazz problem, please call 1-800-GIN-JAZZ. That's 1-800-GIN-JAZZ. Call right now. If it's a white devil jazz problem, you don't have much time. God, of course. Of course jazz played in today's murders. How could it not? But for real, uh, as I was saying earlier, there might have been more to, or there might, you know, be or have been more to today's tale. Informant Anthony Harris's full testimony, which covered 62 pages of grand jury transcript, included him saying that he was told that the death angels were supposed to be a pretty high branch of the nation of Islam and had approximately 2,000 members nationwide. That's a lot of white devil hunters. Uh, Mayor uh, Aliotto's full statement following the arrest of the killer shared even more details uh, than the ones I've already included, speaking to how powerful the death angels may have been. Here's some more excerpts. The San Francisco police, under the leadership of Chief Donald Scott, have pierced the veil of a vicious ring of murders called Death Angels. The local group is a division of a larger organization dedicated to the murder and mutilation of whites and dissident blacks. The pattern of killing is by random street shooting or hacking to death with machete, cleaver, or knife. Decapitation or other forms of mayhem bring special credit from the organization for the killers. Hitchhikers are a particular prey. Death Angels, a kind of reverse uh, Ku Klux Klan, I think I said clue earlier, uh, is based on the muddled aberrations clearly outside the mainstream of Islamic religions. In my opinion, it represents as much a potential threat to blacks as to whites. Members are usually characterized by trim, neat appearance and purport to live by a puritanical code of moral conduct. They are fanatical believers in black separatism. The training of young boys, 14 years of age and over, in what they call the martial arts, is a practice of this group. It consists of teaching manual methods and techniques of killing or incapacitating. Our intelligence indicates that the national leader of this organization is apparently located outside of California and that he determines levels of promotion in the local divisions. The death angels who use wings as an insignia literally earn their promotions upon presentation of proof of the number and nature of the murders committed. Nearly 80 California murderous assaults, principally in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Alameda, and San Francisco counties between September of 1970 to date have been characterized by the Death Angel pattern of operations, i.e. unprovoked attacks involving random shootings of whites in the street or mutilation of, by heavy bladed weapons committed by neatly dressed young black men. Special care must be taken by public officials and the police to prevent hate groups from converting a criminal investigation into a racial struggle. The inescapable fact of the matter is that most mass murders of recent years 
Manson, the Santa Cruz murderers, Corona, and Zodiac have been white. Murder knows no color and must be fought without aggravating sensitive racial tensions. For that reason, numerous blacks and whites with unquestioned credentials in the black community must participate in these law enforcement efforts. However, it should be clear that a constitutional assault on a murderous society of brutal killers cannot be diminished because its members are black any more than if, if they were white. Murder is murder, and no community will endure that approaches the struggle for effective law enforcement with anything less than rugged determination to wipe out organized lawlessness. So was this organization uh, ever wiped out nationally? I don't think so. Uh, very little has ever been written about them. You start doing web searches for the Nation of Islam, Death Angels, or Calistran, uh, and most of what comes up is related to the zebra murders. If this network was indeed as large as Anthony Harris believed, it doesn't seem as if it has ever been infiltrated and brought down on a national level. If there was some national Death Angel leader operating somewhere outside of California, I cannot find any press claiming that he was caught, or even who his identity might be, right? Who he might be. Maybe the Nation of Islam shut this group down internally after the zebra murders. Maybe they never existed to the extent the FBI and other law enforcement and Anthony Harris seemed to believe in 1974. Maybe they just fizzled out. Or maybe some death angels are still out there, still trying to bring about the end of 6,000 years of oppression by murdering as many white devils as possible. If the last living zebra murder, uh, murderer, Larry Green, knows anything, he surely isn't talking. Uh, let's wrap up now with a few looks back at what we've already covered and also learn something new in today's Top 5 Takeaways. Time suck. Top 5 Takeaways. Number one, authorities believe that the zebra killers murdered at least 15 people, injured at least eight others. Uh, all their victims were white that they chose at random. The killers were believed to be death angels, members of a group of part of the Nation of Islam that supposedly is dedicated to killing whites who are member uh, who members are taught to believe are creatures that are born evil. The zebra killers' first victims were a married couple out for an evening stroll, hacked with a machete. Uh, Keita Haig was stabbed to death after being possibly raped. Her husband, Richard, would survive and give the police the first detailed description of the killers. Number two, the killers knew each other from working at Black Self-Help Moving and Storage and from NOI Mosque Number 26. Black Self-Help was a nonprofit organization meant to provide job opportunities in the Bay Area for black Muslims who needed a fresh start, typically after leaving prison. Instead of starting a new crime-free life, the killers used the meeting room at BSH to create a plot to obtain weapons and murder white devils. Number three, one of the killers, Jesse Cooks, was arrested on October 30th, 1973, just a few minutes after murdering 28-year-old student Francis Rose. It would take the police months to connect him to the murder of Keita Haig. Cooks ended up being the only killer willing to confess and admit to the racial motivation of the murders. The other three attempted to come up with alibis and denied being a part of the Death Angels. Informant Anthony Harris would corroborate the Death Angel claims of Jesse Cooks, though. Number four, while the task force was trying to solve some racially motivated murders, internal racial conflicts were rocking the SFPD. Officers for Justice, a minority union within the police department, sued the SFPD for misconduct and bias. Inspectors uh, Guilford and Sanders were the only black homicide inspectors within the SFPD, and they worked some of the murder cases along with the Zebra Task Force. Had Harris not ratted out his associates, uh, who knows how long it would have taken this conflicted police department to catch the killers. Number five, new info. The Nation of Islam is not the only religious group that openly vilifies and demonizes all white people in America today. Uh, there is also the black Hebrew Israelites. We have to suck them someday. I touched on them before in that Nation of Yahweh uh, cult suck too. Another truly terrible organization. More and more articles have been emerging in recent years describing them as becoming more and more militant. Do they perhaps have a death angel equivalent group within their ranks? Around the country, thousands of men and women have joined black supremacist groups on the extremist fringe of the Hebrew-Israelite movement, a black nationalist uh, theology that dates back to the 19th century. Its doctrine asserts that African Americans are God's true chosen people because they, not the people known to the world today as the Jews, are the real descendants of the Hebrews of the Bible. They believe that Jews are devilish imposters and they openly condemn all whites as evil personified, uh, deserving of death or slavery. The notorious white supremacist leader Tom Metzger once remarked of extremist Hebrew Israelites, they're the black counterparts of us. Uh, I guess uh, fucking, you know, uh, grind respects grind or some fucking nonsense there. Uh, the belief system of extremist Hebrew Israelites is basically the reversed color mirror image of the Christian identity theology embraced by many white supremacists. 
which holds that mainstream Jews are the descendants of Satan and that white people are the chosen ones, divinely endowed by God with superior status over quote unquote mud people, uh, believers terms uh, term for non-white individuals. And since 2000, when the prophecy of a key leader failed to materialize, uh, he predicted Christ would return to earth at the dawn of the new millennium to wreak bloody fucking vengeance on whites. Uh, the rhetoric of extremist Hebrew Israelite sects has been steadily heating up with increasing talk of an impending apocalypse and a God ordained race war, right? The, the doomsday groups, they always do that, right? Doomsday comes and passes and like, ah, we're going to fucking double down on a new doomsday. Uh, there are now extremist Hebrew Israelite churches in cities throughout Florida, Maryland, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, New Jersey, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, and Oregon, at least. Uh, there's a church in West Baltimore on Franklin Street or at least was as of several years ago. Looks like it might have closed recently based on doing some Google and Apple map searching or based on how they operate. They, they might just want to look closed. Uh, but at least as a few as of a few years ago, entrance to its Saturday Sabbath sessions required a vigorous and often intimidating screening. First, there was a the question of skin tone, right? Those of European ancestry need not apply. Get the fuck out of here, white devil. And, and you would get shit said like that to you if you tried to enter. Black Hebrew is like street preachers. You can find tons of videos on YouTube. Uh, very aggressive towards white passerbyers. If uh, black, you would still have to meet certain strict conditions to enter. You would have to promise the guards that you were clean, that you hadn't eaten pork or had sex in the prior 24 hours. Because fucking God's watching. Uh, if God knows you entered with that room though, and you had sex within the past 24 hours, he's, he's fucking pissed. He's a big stickler on a lot of weird rules. Uh, you must explain how you learned about the church, why you had chosen to attend, you had to assure guards that you're not a law enforcement officer or spy from a rival rival Hebrew Israelite group, and then had to give up your photo identification. Any recording device uh, you had on your person, if you did, would be confiscated during an aggressive pat down search carried out by armed guards. What the fuck? Nothing shady going on here. Uh, when the door is unbolted briefly to allow you into the building, you would walk into a tiny vestibule where you'd be required to enter your name, address, and telephone number onto into a ledger. If you uh, were found to have a cell phone, it would be confiscated and stored in a file cabinet until you left. And you'd be issued a King James version of the Bible. And if you had a different version of the Bible with you, it would be taken from you. <laughs> Finally, a disciple would approach and he would pour olive oil on your head as a final cleansing measure. Make sure you're a fucking rock hard father daddy covering you in oil. Uh, not a white one though. You gotta be a fucking hot, hard black father daddy. Uh, now you can enter the inner sanctum. And what might you now hear? Well, you would hear about church enemies. Extremist Hebrew Israelites have a long, strange list of enemies. At the top of the list are white people who they preach are descended from a, a race of red, hairy beans known as Edomites, spawned by Esau, twin brother of Jacob, later known as Israel in the Old Testament. Equally hated are fraudulent Jews, uh, the, quote, synagogue of Satan. They're closely followed in no particular order by Asians, uh, promiscuous black women, abortionists, continental Africans, who, according to the extremist Israelites, sold the lost tribes of Israel who were black to European slave traders, uh, gay people, uh, according to extreme Israelites, should be uh, all put to death. The organization has been re, uh, been reported to openly attack uh, homosexual people in public on numerous occasions over the past couple decades. Recruiting literature describing the extremist Israelite doctrine is harsh. Does the Bible teach unity of races? No, it says. Uh, this is one of the Israelite church's widely distributed flyers. Will the different nations who believe in Jesus be saved from the Lord's wrath? No, all caps. Was Jesus Christ a Caucasian man? No. Well, that part's true. Does his color matter? Yes. Nonsense. Sermon heard by a journalist back in 2008 in West Baltimore revolved mainly around God restoring power to Judah, black Israelites, and punishing Edom, white people with a lot of death. The anonymous reporter, apparently afraid of retaliation if their name was used, said the preacher said, the army of Judah also captured 10,000 men alive, took them to the top of a cliff and threw them down so that all were dashed to pieces. These are you know, a bunch of white people. In one scene from The God, the Gods of Times Square, a 2007 documentary uh, on the uh, Hebrew Israelites, an extreme street preacher uh, actually delivers a sermon with his foot planted on the back of some self-hating white guy laying flat on the sidewalk, arms played at his sides. And a second preacher approaches the camera and says, white boy, you're next. All you white people get ready for war. We're coming for you, white boys. Negroes are the real Jews. Get ready for war. What a fucking strange world we live in, Meat Sacks. What a world. Time suck. Top five takeaways. 
the Death Angels have been sucked. Uh, glad at least some of those fuckers got caught for their senseless racist killings. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making Time Suck again this week. Big thanks to Lindsay Cummins. Uh, thanks to the Art Warlock, Logan Keith, producing, directing today. Uh, to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., helping with production. Thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app. The Art Warlock, Logan Keith, again, for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com. And for helping run our socials, along with our Suck Ranger and team managed by our social media strategist, Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for the initial research this week. Uh, great job digging through a lot of old newspaper archives. Thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page. The Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth. And everyone over on the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Next week on Time Suck, we're going to get conspiratorial again. It's been a while. With the Space Lizard chosen topic of the Skull and Bones Society. With powerful members and mysterious rituals, the Skull and Bones Society has long been associated with sinister conspiracy theories. Legend has it that in 1918, under the cover of darkness, Yale student Prescott Bush dug up the grave of Geronimo. Bush, along with several co-conspirators, took the skull and two bones of the famed Apache leader back to Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, where they've been on display at the headquarters of one of America's most mysterious secret societies ever since. Or that's a bunch of nonsense. Prescott Bush, father of President George H.W. Bush, grandfather of George W. Bush, a bonesman. All three bonesmen. What are they hiding? Throughout history, some of the most prominent American figures have been bonesmen, hand-picked members of Yale's undergraduate class, selected to join the ranks of elite students. In addition to the Bushes, members have included hundreds of government officials, such as former Secretary of State John Kerry, as well as members of the entertainment industry, like actor Paul Giamatti. What the fuck, Paul? Aside from notable alumni and a few legends, not much is really known about the Elusive Society. The initiation process of the society has uh, been long shrouded in secrecy, driving many to believe that it involves occult practices like black magic and animal sacrifice. Are the rumors true? We'll find out next week and uh, probably mix a lot of silly into a lot of history. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Going to start off with a badass night witches update coming from a badass meat sack, Jade Welch, who writes, Suck Squad Supreme, Master of Knowledge and Shenanigans, Queen of Crystalline, <laughs> Crystalline Commodities, and Best Boy Bojangles. Your coverage of the night witches was awesome and better than I could have hoped for, even though my knowledge of these ladies and their sisters and cockpits was pretty limited before this. Your silly jokes, they're not jokes, I get it, about making a movie about these absolute goddesses, uh, you know, uh, maybe several movies or possibly an entire show, made me really happy. They deserve so much more recognition than they have. In spirit of giving those glorious boss women more love and attention, I have a band to introduce to you and the Suckverse. Uh, it is uh, Sabaton. Most of their songs, thanks for the pronunciation guide. I think we, we did play this on the Secret Suck a while back, but it's good to do it on Time Suck. Most of their songs are about little known battles and skirmishes, legendary groups, battalions, even war heroes. For example, remember the Finnish sniper nicknamed the White Death? Sabaton has a song of the same name about the same man. They have a song about Ragnarok called Swedish Pagans. Another one about Thor called Twilight of the Thunder God. That's awesome. Now that I've introduced this, should be much better known, so I will tell everyone about them so they can get the love they deserve. Band, the first ever rock band to receive the Swedish Skeptics Association's Enlightener of the Year Award for 2022, which is usually reserved for authors, academics, media outlets, and journalists. I want to tell you about the song that inspired this email. I won't lie. I waited for a really long time for you to say something about this song and was ultimately disappointed when he didn't. But it's cool because you probably didn't know they exist. Anyways, the song I want to talk about, The Night Witches. The song is, as you can probably tell, about the Night Witch Division and how ruthlessly effective they were at carrying out their orders. The song begins with, From the depths of hell in silence, cast their spells, explosive violence. Russian nighttime flight perfected, flawless vision undetected. And the chorus is, Canvas wings of death, prepare to meet your fate. Night Bomber Regiment 588, undetected, unexpected wings of glory. Tell their story, aviation, deviation, undetected, stealth, perfected. Second verse is even cooler. Foes are losing ground, retreating to the sound. Death is in the air. Suddenly appears, confirming all your fears. Strike from witch's lair. Target found, come around, barrel sound. From the battleground, axis aiming high. Rodina awaits, defeat them at the gates. Live to fight and fly. This was long and I'm not sorry. Going back to the subject line, I will figure out where you live. <laughs> Come to your front door with a rubber pitchfork, size to be determined, 
and a fake torch and politely ask your wife or whoever else answers the door if I can stand on the edge of your yard and hold my pitchfork while staring menacingly at your house and tell you shout out this amazing band. Love you and your work. Lots. P.S. I'll walk your dogs for free when I'm not staring at your house with disdain. Please just give this band some recognition because they deserve it and their songs are so cool. Well, thank you, Jade. Uh, others recommended this badass song as well. And so I will play a little snippet of Sabaton. Sabaton. There we go. Night Witches. Yeah, man. It's good. It's good stuff. So you guys can find him now. Uh, well, thank you again. And now next up, Hot Heart Father Daddy Joseph Heiler has a shout-out request that is covered in olive oil. He writes, Hola, hot olive oil-soaked Father Daddy of Suckdan. I want to shout-out my best friend and brother from another mother, Zach Grice, for convincing me to join the cult of the curious and become a loyal time sucker. This glorious man all but adopted my depressed ass my first year of college and has made my life genuinely worth living. I only found out, I only found out about Time sucked because of Dan Sember. When I had to ask him why he kept changing his profile picture to some creepy man. Oh, that'd be me. Uh, every December. Only to be suggested an episode on the Church of Satan, which I was very curious about. Then comes your Dungeons and Dragons episode, and he officially has me hooked on the suck and learning and weird humor of a glorious oil-drenched father daddy. I'm working my way through the back catalog of sucks. When I catch up, scared to death is next on my sights. Never stop being you, Joseph. Well, thank you, Joseph. I hope you fucking love... Uh, this weirdness because I, I don't know how to do it a, a different way. Uh, now for something a little heavier. A brave ass sucker going by the pseudonym of Colorado shares some heavy and important stuff writing, Dan Speaker of Truce and King of the Cult, also all the people who keep this cult going. Queen, Logan, all. I send my love and appreciation. I have so much more recognition I could give however this doesn't feel like the time. Uh, I didn't think my first time writing in would be so gosh dang morbid. Sorry this can't be on a brighter note. I am going to keep this short as it is still a bit of a living nightmare. Since starting to listen to Time Suck a few years ago, there has been one huge thing that always hit me in the feels. And that is how much you stick up for survivors and how you speak about the people who commit these atrocious crimes. And I always felt like you were speaking to me. I always joked to myself, if only Dan was my real friend, maybe I could be that strong. It was after listening to your podcast and being given the RAIN organization's information that I've decided I can too, I can too be that strong or at least try to be. I won't get into details as it is a current investigation and I am beyond scared. One may even say scared to death. I know, I know. How can she be making jokes at a time like this? Because gosh heck, it is all I do to keep myself from flashbacks and crying. This is sadly not my first go at this. That was my minister uncle, Jesus Christ, who adopted me. Uh, between you and me, I could uh, be a suck all of my own. Now, isn't that a depressing thought? At any rate, thank you. Thank you for being so outspoken about the stuff. Thank you for being my true crime Jiminy Cricket. That's a great reference. Uh, this can be read in a suck, but it is not at all expected. I will ask that my name stay out of it for my safety. If you would like, I can send updates. But I know you are a busy dude, have a lot going on. Oh, and damn it, Zuckerberg. Oh, and damn it, Zuckerberg, for taking away the cult of Curious 2 when I could have used that support. We do got another one. There always, there's always more popping up. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Also, thank you to my best friend and the person who keeps me from losing my mind, Ashen Dova, his nickname. My pseudonym is Colorado. Well, Colorado, good on you. For getting the truth out, pursuing justice uh, for your attacker. So glad you are doing this, which will likely inspire others to do the same. So much more powerful coming from you than it could be from me. Uh, I am truly in awe of your bravery. Can't imagine how hard what you're doing is and you're fucking badass. So much respect for what you're doing. And yeah, the Rain National Sexual Assault Hotline is 1-800-656-4673 or 1-800-656-HOPE. Operators are working 24 hours a day uh, to, to just listen, help you report, help you seek counseling, help you however they can. Uh, hail Colorado. And last up, another Night Witches update from Night Witch Fangirl and Super Sucker, Mandy Gennard, who writes, Hey, mofo, a.k.a. Dan, a.k.a. Hot Father Daddy, a.k.a. Amazing Human Being. I would be honored if you'd read this in the next episode. Done. Thank you for doing a suck of the baddies of the Night Witches. After hearing them mentioned in a previous suck, I did a presentation about their story in a work meeting. That's cool. Many of my coworkers were both shocked how they don't appear in history as much as they should. Fast forward to the morning I'm writing this. I've been dealing with a shitload of health issues, including chronic pain in my back and jaw. This past year has been fuck. Uh, yeah, I had fucking. Uh, it's because of my mouth. This past year has been brutal. I'll read the words as you say them. 
I had major burnout from my last job and got a new one this October. It's one thing after another with my health. It's real bad. I'm only 31. Today, I couldn't get out of bed until well into the afternoon. Uh, the weight of all of this is crushing. I have also te- I also have testing for what is wrong with me, what's wrong with my stupid meat suit tomorrow, and I'm nervous. Once I did get up and decided to cook some food for the week, I saw you put out a new episode on these ladies, and it made my day. I then got a call from my friend checking in on me. Shout out to Lena. With all these struggles, these little wins mean so much. Full chronic pain, and please play... Right now, thank you so much for bringing these amazing women to life. I look forward to new episodes every single week. Don't forget to pet your pets and water your plants. Cheers, Manda. Heart sign. Well, I hope you feel uh, better soon, Manda. Uh, I, I am glad that you love these badasses too. Uh, thank you for sending that in. Um, and, and, and also, I feel weird not saying this. I, I'm so flattered when so many of you say nice things uh, about me at the start of messages. It is very kind, but it is never necessary. Just know that. Uh, you don't have to do that to get a message played. If you have some cool update or want a shout out request or just whatever, you, you could open with, I think you're a ridiculous piece of shit that can barely speak one language. And it will receive the same odds of making it into the show as a compliment would. Uh, I just mean to say that for a while. I just don't want people to think I'm some egomaniacal diva who requires ego stroking to, to play messages. T- tell your king how wonderful his rule is or be gone from here. Uh, bend the knee and kiss the ring or be banished from the suctum. Nah, that's not how it works. Uh, hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, everyone. Thanks for continuing to send in these messages. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Please don't kill any random white devils this week. Some of us are, are okay. Some of us are assholes, but I assure you that's true for everybody. And if you don't believe that, well, then you're one of the assholes and and you got more learning to do and you need to stick around and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. (laughs) I did it. Fucking trick these idiot whites into thinking that the black angels are possibly no more. Oh, not just you white devils are masters of technology. This guy is too. A fucking death angel that's been fucking with you the whole time, idiots. Here comes the war. You think this is a game? We out here. We been out here. You think it's a joke? Actually, Nimrod isn't a half chupacabra, half Sasquatch. That's some white people shit. Nimrod is a black hunter from the Bible, stay woke. To hell in the- Wait. <laughs>